We are recording. Thank you. It is, it is April 2, 2024. This is a special meeting of the Community Resources Committee. Uh, and we are opening our meeting at 6.32. Pursuant to, the chap to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone to listen. Um, we have a very focused uh, meeting today. We are very pleased to see folks who are interested in participating uh, on the ZBA. And um, we will start, we will sort of do a little rundown. So I think it would be fun to actually just go around and have everyone introduce themselves. And I'm going to just call on people by their name on the screen in the order that I see them. Um, so just introduce yourself to each other and then we will um, get into the nuts and bolts of how we want to structure the meeting. So Hilda. You're, you're, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Um, is this how you're going to do the hear and be heard? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So you want to know I'm here. You're and here. I live in North Amherst. What else would you like to know? Uh, just introduce yourself. Okay. Hilda Greenbaum, North Amherst. Thank you. Uh, in order of my screen, Pam Rooney, um, Cottage Street. Uh, John Varner. Hi, I'm John Varner. I live on Jeffrey Lane in South Amherst. Mr. Sloviter. I'm David Sloviter. I live on Lincoln Avenue in Amherst. Craig Meadows. Craig Meadows, Cottage Street. David Allfeld. You're muted. Can you hear us? Yes, David Offeld. Um, I live in Blue Hills Road, uh, Central Amherst. Um, I'm, I'm just getting messages that my internet may be unstable, so I may have to try to un uh, log off and come back on. And if, if you disappear, we can always pause until we see you again. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Um, yeah, I'm here, Mandy Jo Haneke, and I'm one of the members of the committee. Pat DeAngelis. Hey, I'm here, and I represent District 2, live on Ward Street here at Memphis Brook. Thank you. Rizwana Khan. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we do. Okay, great. Okay, I'm Rizwana Khan. I live on Amity Street in uh, Amherst. Thank you. Councillor Ette. Um, hello, um, this is Freke. It's a councillor Ete, and I represent District 1. Thank you. Jennifer Taub. Hi, I'm Jennifer Taub. I'm one of the CRC members, and I represent District 4 with Pam. And Vincent O'Connor, who's here on the phone. Yes, good evening. Good. So we can hear everyone? Perfect. Perfect. So how we were going to set it out is to um, to just do the questions that were sent to you um, ahead of time. And at the end of the questions, we will take the time tonight to actually deliberate and, and hopefully put things forward to the town council to vote on um, at our uh, either our next meeting or the meeting after next meeting. Um, recollection of that. The next council meeting is April 8th. And I'm not sure if we're able to post that in time, but I think we may be able to make that agenda item. So in any, in any case, um, we're going to start by uh, the councilors will, will in order in reverse alphabetical order, we'll read each of the questions 
and then we will alternate uh, the recipients, the applicants, again in reverse alphabetical order, and um, and we'll just go through each time we ask a new question. It will be a it'll be a uh, a new member that starts the the answering. Jennifer. And I want to say thanks to Jennifer for all of the back and forth and scheduling that that took place to make this happen. Yeah. And thank you all for making the time to be here. So um, I, I'm going to ask the first question, and then this will be the order of the respondents. So um, the first would be John Varner, and then David Sloverter, then Vince O'Connor, Craig Meadows, Rizwana Khan, Hilda Greenbaum, and David Offeld. So the first question is, um, what do you feel um, you bring to the ZBA that um, can make it successful? And please include any experience you have ha you've had appearing before the planning board or the ZBA or watching one of their meetings. And we'll start with John. Well, I feel like I have a wealth of experience from different job positions, including uh, work I did for the National Park Service, uh, years as a self-employed carpenter here in the area, and as an operations specialist at a small startup biotech in Amherst. Uh, these positions gave me an appreciation for the uh, importance of preserving the natural environment, uh, what's realistic in terms of construction plans and techniques, and some of the issues that are uh, inherent in developing a low impact research facilities in Amherst. Uh, I have watched a few of the town uh, zoning board meetings and uh, I'm impressed with the uh, rigidity and thoroughness of the uh, the way they are handled. So. Thank you. Thank Actually, you. Jennifer's questions here. Yeah. Um, and again, you have, you know, a couple of minutes about to answer a question, but certainly, you know, you, you don't need to take the, the full two minutes. So moving on to David Sloboder. I bring to the committee a lot of years of running a small business. I've also been in other businesses, including real estate development, hotel operations in Colorado. But mostly, I bring to this committee that I have been on this committee as an associate member for two years, and I have sat on quite a number of panels, partially because the full members of the committee are down one because there was a resignation, so there's been a greater opportunity for the associate members to serve and as a result, I've been on quite a number of committees over the last two years panels, and they have been of very varying kinds of requests. So I've seen a lot and know how the committee works and understand the role of the committee. So I bring to the committee continuing participation and experience and knowledge on the committee. Thank you, David. Um, next, we'll move to Vince O'Connor. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so I did serve for six months uh, last year um, on the committee. And, um, and prior to that, I had, had participated in three appeals to the Zoning Board of Appeals, two of which were successful um, regarding violations of the zoning bylaw that were upheld by the zoning board. Um, I've also initiated a, a large number of planning board articles, uh, a number of which were, have, were adopted by the town meeting. And I've lived in town a long time, have, have a lot of experience in work with Habitat for Humanity on the six of their first seven houses, um, was on the town hall committee, so I'm very familiar with large scale plans. And um, I bring to the committee the ability to both look at the proposals and their impacts on the community and on the, on the individuals, in case of residential things, that proposals that, um, that will be housed uh, in, in whatever facility is proposed. 
So I have a broad experience, and uh, I think uh, it is important to have members who have that breadth of experience. Okay. Thank you very much, Vince. Uh, Craig Meadows. I think you're mu still muted. Try to stay Sorry. muted when I can. <laughs> we can hear you now. Okay. I, I've been on the committee for the last, uh, of the ZBA for the last four years. Uh, and I believe in addition to the four years of experience that I've had on the committee and uh, uh, the fact that I've acted as chair on a number of occasions when Steve uh, Judge has not been available. I've also found that my work is in energy conservation is added uh, to our deliberations on a number of occasions. Knowing uh, the, the newest grants available for EV charging in the IRA dollar availability allows me to provide some guidance on occasion for um, some of the uh, the requests that we've had in front of the ZBA. In a, okay. That's a, Thank you. Are you you're welcome? I didn't want to cut you off. Are you done? I am done. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, Rizwana Khan. Yeah. Hi. hi. Okay, I am um, presently involved in education and my background is also in community engagement and advocacy. I'm very um, much involved in the committees over here. And I also believe uh, in the smart growth principles and uh, in comprehensive planning because of my background, I can analyze uh, and um, problem solve issues and collaborate with people and that is very important to me that this uh, area stays uh, open to affordable housing also and I understand the connections between uh, the grants especially that uh, should be coming over here because uh, it's a very small town Amherst and all these uh, community engagements are very important the stakeholders they play a very important part so uh, with that, um, I think I will be able to contribute with my practical experience in advocacy and community involvement. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We'll move next to Hilda Greenbaum. Not used to tooting my own horn. I don't know what to say. I've lived in this town a long time, so I can add history to the board. Um, been through four building inspectors, each having their own way of interpreting the bylaw and what needs a permit and what doesn't need a permit. Um, I previously served eight years and with last year as an associate, I've served nine years and served on a lot of hearings in these last nine months. Um, I, I, I've been a, a solicitor, I've been on the Transportation Committee, I've been town meeting member for 44, 45 years. Um, I know the bylaw pretty well. I don't know what else to say. If I'm a contribution to the committee, I'd like to be appointed again. If I'm not, take somebody else. That's, I guess, what I got to say about this matter. Thank you, Hilda. And uh, last but not least, for the first question to David Offelt, please. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so I would be brand new to this work. Um, I retired five years ago from uh, teaching civil engineering at UMass, and I did that for 20 years and 10 years before that at UConn. My expertise is in water-related issues, um, especially groundwater. Um, I've taught courses and done research in related issues, uh, storm drain, stormwater drainage, site development, septic issues. Many of the technical water-related items that I think might come before the, uh, the board. Uh, I've also had um, a fair amount of, uh, I've worked as a house builder in, in over the years in the past and still do that intermittently. 
So I have some familiarity how, with how uh, construction projects come together and what is needed for them. Uh, I'll just relate a quick story about, uh, I, I watched the ZBA meeting regarding the um, Amity Street University Drive project down by the old rafters uh, um, facility building. And um, the um, applicants, uh, the, the applicant was seeking a special permit, I believe, and claiming, um, and I think rightly so, I, I personally supported the project, uh, but claiming um, problems with a high water table and uh, soils, difficult soils, and uh, other site conditions um, that um, uh, made the construction more difficult and, and hence, hence led to the request for a special permit. Um, and I think my expertise would have been useful in that, in that discussion. Um, that, so that's just an example. Um, yeah, so I guess that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you for those responses. I'll turn it back to you, Pam. Okay. I'm up for the second question. And that is, tell us about an experience that you've had collaborating with a group, particularly <laughs> where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. And we will start this round with David Sloboda, please. <clears throat> well, I've been in a number of situations where consensus needed to be built. And the organization that I was a member of, whether uh, at one point I was the a board member and then president of my synagogue outside Philadelphia. And at another point, I was the president of the board of owners of a condominium hotel in Colorado. And in both cases, it involved finding consensus with a relatively large group of people who had differing agendas. And that is where I gathered a lot of the experience that I have that I believe I've also used on the ZBA. And after I got accustomed to how the ZBA operates, uh, it, it's necessary to find a way to work through problems. And listening to other people making sure that everybody feels that they were heard and reasoning in a cooperative manner without anger coming to the surface is something that I have dealt with a lot. And in those kinds of situations, I was pivotal in helping to reach consensus and uh, good decisions in the end. So I have been in large groups where everybody thought they were the boss and everybody thought that their opinion was the only one that should work. And that can't work out. And, uh, and I made sure when I was in a position of authority that in the end it worked. Thank you. We go next to Vince O'Connor and then, and then Craig Meadows. Vince. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think serving in town meeting for as many years as I did um, helped me understand. I mean, I'm, I didn't wasn't discovered till I um, that I needed glasses until I was in the second grade, and as a result, um, the, my first three years in school, I spent a lot of time learning from by listening. And it really helps in group situations to be able to go beyond printed matter and actually hear not only what the, the what people are saying, but how they are saying it. And I think, um, and I did have one, I think, rather successful opportunity during the six months I served to convince the other members of the zoning board that um, that a that a problem with the uh, it, the emergency exits had to be solved, and in the end, 
um, focusing on that problem and enabling the other members to see how it could be solved, um, I think was important because it improved the safety of the project. And that's really what my concern is. I believe in the um, in the focus of Article One uh, that the bylaw is there to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the inhabitants of the town. And that's and that's how I approach my participation. Thank you. Uh, Craig Meadows is next. Well, it, in addition to the occasional situation with the ZBA where decisions may be somewhat controversial, um, I also served as the chair of the Hampshire Community United Way Fund Distribution Committee for a number of years where diverse opinions on how and to whom and where funds were to, to be distributed was often, often controversial and needed to be worked through. Also chairing the uh, Cherry Hill Golf Course Committee for a few years was probably the most controversial situation that I've found myself in, but did manage to get through that. As a survivor, I don't want to go into that. No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll go then to. That... Pardon? <laughs> I said you wouldn't have Terry Hill if it weren't for my being an assessor at the time they first class let it go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move to Rick Wanai's time. Yeah, okay. Pam, I have to excuse myself. I am uh, not going to contest for my candidacy, so uh, I'm going to leave this panel. Is it okay, Pam? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please, Rizwana? I, I do not want to be on the panel anymore because I think uh, uh, they are, you know, I might not be uh, able to do what others I, uh, are able to do because I see <laughs> uh, more uh, able people here. Is it okay if I leave? Uh, just just a minute <laughs> before you do that. Pat has her hand up and then Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know what Jennifer is going to say, but one of the things that I appreciated about uh, your statement of interest was the listening and advocacy and community engagement. I think that the possibility of becoming an associate member is an, is a way to learn um, and to take time. And from so I, I feel like there are people here with many other experiences that are valuable, but the freshness of your eyes, the freshness of your focus on equity and things like that might be really important things for the ZBA to look at. So I know how it can feel to think that you're not uh, knowledgeable enough, uh, but I think that there is a real path of learning. Um, you know, I don't know whether Craig and other people who have served on the committee um, yeah. would say that, but but we picked last year, last time around, someone who had minimal experience. Um, and they're doing a really good job. Okay, um, thank you so much. Yeah, okay, I'll stay then. <laughs> okay, good. Thank All you. right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because I was feeling as if I am uh, very new at it because I do have the passion. Okay, you can go ahead with the next question that well, I, like yeah. to answer, You'd like to answer that, uh, uh, an example of, of collaborating with a group, especially where the opinions conflicted. It sounds like you may have yeah. Yeah, basically uh, the uh, conflicting uh, environment, I am right now working in that environment also, and that is the education. And they are uh, right now, this world I am just taking is in crisis. And uh, there are a lot of uh, conflicts that are not being uh, uh, addressed because of lack of bridges and lack of understandings. And right now, because of the affordable, um, and personally, uh, I have seen, especially in housing um, and appeals, especially ZBAs, all involved in 
appeals and it has as Pat also, um, I'm very, um, thank you Pat for um, reminding me that advocacy is very important because um, over here, the people of color, especially I am one of them. And I know these immigrants that we as immigrant, we come over here and there are some kind of uh, challenges that are more related to um, racial. And so I, uh, they, they told me that I have a friend and she says their son was having problem with the housing that they are uh, renting out. So, so because that is the only industry in Amherst. So um, I actually, uh, create an environment where it is very positive and we and I try to uh, whenever I talk about where I take ownership of the place because it's very important for the community so that uh, that feeling should be always there for everyone and uh, and we are working towards that as you know I attended the last meeting also that um, uh, Pam organized uh, with Jennifer and that was a, a, an amazing meeting where they talked about affordable housing. And that right now, that is a very important issue. And the conflict is still there because of the fact, uh, you know, the funding is only going to come if you we have this acceptance of, you know, brown people and other races that are right now over here. So the conflict is always there because it's a very dynamic um, issue and uh, basically that's all I can say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I will go to uh, Hilda, please. Well, back before this regime, when we had three members on the board, we uh, had lots of landlords converting their people, owners converting their houses to end. We had several notorious cases on Lincoln and Sunset neighborhoods where I was chair, and there would be a room full of your neighbors, you Lincoln Sunset people. And there would be at least 50. And it was quite difficult handling the job of giving, giving everybody a chance to speak when there are that many that want to speak. And we managed to work it out somehow or other. I have another case I can mention with me with three women on the board. And the then building inspector had a uh, uh, request for a building permit from a uh, contractor in South Hadley to redo the siding on Village Park. And there weren't any people from the audience to complain, but what happened is the contractor had already bought more than $200,000 $200, worth of tan vinyl siding to go on Village Park. And then discovered he needed to get a permit. Well, the third person on the board wasn't about to agree with Barbara and me that we should allow him to go ahead with it. But even though his uh, special, the original special permit said any changes to the exterior had to come back to the board. So Barbara and I looked at each other in the eye and we just had to convince the third person that it had to be the color or the nicest thing to do was to let the village park be the light dance. And we caved and let her have some of her brown, dark brown, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Contrasting uh, trim and uh, that's how we worked it out. Cost Village Park more money than they wanted to pay, but that's how we had to work it out to get three people to agree, which was required in those days with the old charter. So I guess you just work as hard as you can for compromise and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Thank you. And our last, last question goes to David Alfeld. I think I'll tell the story about a time I was on the Board of Health uh, I, I served on the board for the board of health, that is for seven years. And I was chair for three years. And I believe, I, I, yeah, I was chair during this event. We were approached by an advocacy group to um, 
strengthen our smoking regulations, tobacco smoking regulations. And we were looking at regulations relating to outdoor smoking uh, in say outdoor cafe settings or other other public settings. And we were considering, and, and there were some members of the board who and, and, and advocates who were going for a broader um, ban. Uh, it was proposed to, was considered to, uh, and proposed, yeah, to ban smoking on the common, on the town common. Uh, and, and we had different opinions about this. We had a public hearing, uh, uh, of course, about these topics. And um, this was back, as uh, did I mention this was a dozen years or so ago, so long before Zoom was so popular. And also uh, back when the extravaganza event was a big deal in town. And we were quite stunned to have about 100 representatives from the extravaganza group come and tell us that they didn't think banning smoking on the town common was a good idea. So we, we added that to our input and eventually settled on a compromise position that, that I think was protective of public health, but also reasonable in the sense of uh, what would work for enforcement, what would work for restaurant owners and others that were involved, other stakeholders. And I almost forgot that I need to circle back to John Varner uh, to finish yes. off this. Yeah, I uh, I would like to focus on a very specific uh, concrete example. <clears throat> Immediately after the COVID lockdown, uh, I was faced with making policy decisions at a ceramic studio that I manage. Uh, after several Zoom meetings, uh, it was apparent that uh, several of our members were anxious to get back to work in the studio, but uh, others were very unwilling or reluctant to risk, risk exposure. So I uh, instituted procedures for reporting infections to the group, uh, protocols for masking and surface disinfection and a Google sign-up calendar in order to uh, uh, allow people to uh, limit the number of people in the studio at uh, any one time. Uh, I also uh, consulted with our co-directors and we agreed that uh, we could initiate a fee schedule that allowed members to retain their rental spaces um, <clears throat> for a minimal fee uh, until they were comfortable with returning to the studio. Uh, so we succeeded in striking a balance that resulted in uh, a very few members relinquishing their spaces and no COVID infections in the studio um, uh, related to exposure there. Um, and as an aside, I would uh, suggest that uh, you could talk to Steve Judge, who was a member of the studio at that time. And I do recall that he was uh, rather impressed with uh, the way the situation was handled. So uh, that's uh, sort of a, a microcosm of uh, my uh, attempts to handle a, a thorny situation. Thank you. I'm going to ha hand off the questions to Mandy Johanneke for question three. Thank you. Um, this question is, please explain the difference between the role of the ZBA and the role of the planning board. And we will start um, with Vince O'Connor. Well, um, first, the uh, the zoning board really is is confined to to enforcing and hearing permits and so forth. They are not involved in initiating new zoning, although um, usually every six months to a year they find anomalies and problems in the zoning bylaw and they refer it to the planning board. So the zoning board, and and the zoning board really deals with primarily with projects that are um, that require that aren't by right in a district. They need special permits, and so you have to be somewhat knowledgeable about the areas of town where projects are proposed have to be sensitive to neighborhood concerns because the, that involves some of the findings under section 12.38 that you have to make to approve a special permit. So the, the 
the the level of findings and the specific findings that are required for zoning board um, decisions and permits are much more detailed than some of the approvals of the planning board and and the activities of the planning board in proposing new new bylaws and in um, interacting with town staff and advocates uh, to alter the zoning bylaws. So those are, to my mind, the primary differences. Thank you. We will move to Craig Meadows. Uh, essentially, the difference, not an essential, the planning board guides the overall physical growth and development of the town through the adoption and implementation of the master plan with consideration for uh, zoning bylaw changes and land use development projects. Whereas the, the ZBA uh, permits granting authority for requests of special permits and variance from the requirements of the, of the zoning bylaws. Um, Different aspects, similar, but very different charges for each of them. Thank you. Um, Rizwana Khan, yeah. you are next. Yeah, zoning board is very technical, I think, because of the fact it has appeals in there and variances, and one has to be very uh, sensitive, and that's where the collaboration comes in and see the situation, because mm -hmm. every property is different. So there might be some multi multiple family homes in one uh, area that is being built. So the heights might be different. And so there's so many variances to it. And then there are appeals also involved in it. So it is a very taxing, uh, um, um, I guess, uh, a very taxing uh, position uh, for the uh, for the people who are uh, trying to figure this out in that board. And uh, all, the planning board is basically planning for the future, the zoning by laws, and, and then the reviews and feedbacks are all for the uh, planning board. And uh, it has to be also, there is a legislative body that is connected to that. And then there are amendments and so on. So it is the planning board is basically looking at the future of the area of the town. Thank you. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum. Well, traditionally, uh, zoning from one chapter 40 was for 40A was first written. It was pretty clear that planning board's plan and thought about what the vision for the town would be. And, and subsequently, many years later, we have master plans. But about 20 years ago, the Commonwealth decided that we aren't building enough housing and, and it's, it's become critical that we aren't building enough housing to keep the workforce here. They can't afford to live here, so they're taking jobs other places and the, Money is now set aside to try to fix this problem. Um, basically, being the planners, they were the ones that made the bylaws. And Zoning Board of Appeals was instituted in order to enforce the bylaws so that there was a clear separation of powers. But as I said, more recently, the housing has become a crisis again. And to make permitting much easier, um, planning board was allowed to do site plan review on lots of projects that otherwise would have gone to planning board first to give an opinion to the zoning board to decide. And, and that was a very timely process. And so therefore, zoning board got the permits that were not allowed by right that were for reasons of um, health and welfare of the town um, went for the site went for special permits for the zoning board of appeal so the, the, so originally there was a split authority now now it isn't any longer 
whether this process really works to bring more housing, I don't know, but the the Commonwealth is working on it. Thank you. Um, David Offeld. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what I can add to what the our, the other panelists have said about this, but I, I, I guess the way I would summarize it is the, po the planning board handles uh, policy through setting zoning and uses within zones and so on. And the ZBA handles specific sites, specific cases, which may involve um, exceptions or, or, or variances or special permits um, to the general rules set down by the planning board. Um, I, I'll come back to the, the site on, that I was just talking about on University Drive in Amity. Um, my understanding is the planning board is working on a, I believe it's an overlay of the a zoning overlay for the whole for all of University Drive, which would change zoning, uh, change uh, or um, make it somewhat easier to develop properties in, in certain ways. And then the ZBA dealt with a specific property. So general general versus specific is the way I'm, I look at it. Thank you. Uh, John Farner. I think uh, David is right uh, most succinctly. I think uh, planning board sets the regulations and, and zoning rules and ZBA determines uh, when to grant exceptions uh, exemptions to those rules. Thank you. Um, or, <laughs> was was that all? <laughs> As if. And last is David Slavater. Well, I don't think I can explain it any better than Craig Meadows explained it, so I won't try. I would only add that at the beginning of each of our ZBA uh, panels, our, our chair, Steve Judge, always mentions that the ZBA is a quasi-judicial body. We are charged with enforcing the existing laws. We don't make policy. We don't plan. We, we listen to applications for exceptions to the rules, and then we, we rule on that. But we are there to interpret existing laws. Thank you. I will now pass this over to Councillor Ette for the next question. Thank you, Mandy. Um, question four is, when interpreting a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider the intent of that provision, its common sense meaning, and or some other factor? I'll take that again. Um, when interpreting a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider the intent of that provision, its common sense meaning, and or some other factor? And I'll start by asking Mr. Meadows. Uh, actually, all, all of those factors need to be considered in every case. Since the board is not ruled by precedence, there has to be a consideration of every factor for each request that's to be considered on its own merits. Thank you. Mrs. Khan. Yes, I also agree with the fact that uh, there's always common sense is involved, but there are other factors also because it's not a cookie cutter situation in in real estate and you know zoning. So we have to be very careful as to uh, have the intent of the provision uh, also and understand the purpose and objectives, especially uh, when there is some kind of appeal and so on. So ZBA can also consider the, you know, common sense uh, meaning of the provision also. So, and then there's a contextual uh, factors and, and there has to be consistent. Basically, I think it should be very consistent. Uh, it should not be biased. So that's where the equity comes in. 
and also we are looking at public interest and, and policy goals so it, it's there are lots of variables there and and we have to be very consistent with them and i i think we should uh, always um, reaffirm those uh, values thank you thank you mrs greenbaum well, I guess I would say that every case has to be judged on its own merits. And there are lots of flaws in the bylaw. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to fit a particular situation into what the bylaw says. And if it's a good project, we try to find a way to do it, whatever happens. I went back in the town records, annual reports, to 1927 and the first bylaw trying to find out year by year, looking at the bylaw, bylaw amendments that were passed and defeated to try to figure out what a complementary use was. And I looked online to find complementary use. I looked in, in Mark Wabrowski's zoning uh, bylaw book and see if I could find any cases in there that were related to complementary use. And it didn't exist, essentially. And so that's going to be something that the zoning board is going to have to study this year because you can't always find from any of these methods something that exactly fits what you're trying to do. Thank you. The next will be Alfeld. Yes, thank you. So I looked at this question and thought about, okay, how would we handle a particular um, required finding for a hypothetical case? And so I looked at um, finding 10.382. The proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. So what's a nuisance? It comes the, the question, what constitutes a nuisance? I mean, I have a sense of what a nuisance might be. Hearing from the neighbors of the proposed uh, facility or project might clarify, it might, might give a broader definition of what a nuisance is. There might be uh, some guidance from um, the planning board or, or perhaps a, a, a historical review like uh, Ms. Greenbaum has just described that would give more insight. So I'm I'm not sure how to how to wrestle with that. I guess I guess looking at all those pieces is um, is would be the way to approach that. Thank you. Mr. Varner. Yeah, um, well, recognizing that the ZBA's role is to consider specific issues and grant or reject uh, proposed variances to those regulations, there's difficulty in addressing hypothetical uh, situations. Uh, and in part, this is due to the fact that there's there are contradictory regulations in the zoning bylaws. For example, uh, one uh, bylaw prevents the Zoning Board of uh, Appeals from making judgments based on aesthetics, but another bylaw stipulates that in permitted construction, details should blend in with the surrounding architectural elements of neighboring structures and that, quote, visibly offensive structures are not permitted. Um, so there's there's a lot of room for interpretation there. Uh, referring to section 10.38 um, and the subsections of that in the zoning bylaws, um, uh, David has already made allusions to the uh, proposal not uh, uh, constituting a, a nuisance in terms of air, water, water quality, uh, noise, odor, dust, uh, again, visibly uh, offensive structures or site features. 10.83, uh, the proposal would not be a substantial inconvenience or hazard to abutters, vehicles, or pedestrians. Uh, 0.384, uh, adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for proper operation of the proposed use. And 10.385, the proposal reasonably project, uh, protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive uses on the site, including air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. So, you know, I think that the 10.3 uh, section of the 3.8 section of the zoning bylaws is kind of the core of um, the uh, 
Zoning Board of Appeals considerations. Uh, those are the real essential elements to considering any project and giving it a thumbs up or down. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Stovider? I think the obviously common sense should be part of everything we do. And we should consider any factor that comes before the board. But it, it's more than interpreting the intent of something. We have to deal with the rules and the facts. And if somebody is applying for an exception to one of the rules, we have to enforce the rule or make a decision to make an exception if, in my opinion, there's a compelling argument to do that. We recently dealt with an application that wanted to reduce the minimum amount of commercial space in a building from 30% to 10%. And it's not up to the planning board, it's not up to the zoning board, I'm sorry, to decide on what an appropriate amount is. We might individually think that 50% would make more sense, but the rule is 30%. So we can't expand a rule. We can only make an exception to the rule. So we're not interpreting intent. We're enforcing and we are we are committed to be guided by what the rules are that are in place. So I think if we are presented with a compelling argument of hardship or or perhaps a, an argument an argument that is that the exception is of no great significance, then we can uh, vote for an exception. But common sense always, but facts above all. Thank you. Lastly, um, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first, I, I agree with um, Mr. Barner. I think that there are multiple opportunities in almost every uh, consideration by the zoning board to find conflicts in the, in the bylaw itself. And I think it's sometimes not difficult, other times it's a real struggle to resolve those conflicts. Um, I think the best you can do is just try to talk it out, give yourself enough time, really decide um, where you can find a, a good place between the conflicting provisions. Um, with regard to intent, I, um, I go back to the town, various town moderators who, who, have, who warned us continuously that no matter what we intended, what is going to be the basis for the decisions uh, of both the planning board, because the planning board does deal with projects and uh, site plan review, and the zoning board of appeals is what the words say. And um, it is sometimes unfortunate that what people intended did not uh, end up in the wording either effectively or um, precisely. Um, and third, I think that there is, um, and I dealt with this in one one of the situations that I dealt with on the, on the zoning board, is that um, there are regulations which um, govern the minimum that is required of various projects, the minimum. But I think, for example, um, yes, we, we have the, the various uh, requirements for uh, what is the fifth, you know, the hundred-year uh, storm event. Um, but we know those; some of those are just ancient and do not fit the modern circumstance. And I think the zoning board could, and could, and should require um, the most up-to-date do documentation. Um, not something from 50 years ago. And, or, you know, in other things like the number of women's bathrooms 
um, the regulations are clearly inadequate. And in fact, one of my concerns has been um, that in every tragic circumstance involving fires, the one of the first things that is said is um, the requirements that the regulations be changed. Part of our job is to perceive when the regulations are inadequate, where in a specific circumstances, the regulations um, need to be um, improved on through the zoning board's perception of the reality of the project before us. And so that's part of why we're there. Otherwise, everything would be decided by the building commissioner um, based on the regulations. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Councillor DeAngelis. Thank you, Councillor Ette. Um, I have question five, and it reads, in considering those with an interest in a special permit, should the interest of one party be given greater significance than another party? And I'm going to be starting with uh, Rizwana Khan. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, the interest of one party uh, cannot... Uh, cannot be uh, just given more significance than another party uh, if we do not uh, address equal consideration in the fact that equal weight has to be given an importance to all of their um, all of the stakeholders involved in special permit application. So, um, for example, my neighboring property owners or the bro broader community, they all have a stake in the outcome and they, their concerns should be heard and, cons and considered respectfully. And I'm proud to say that the fact that uh, in, in Amherst, this uh, transparency is there, you know, and accountability is there. So because that is the most important thing that if they are able to clearly articulate the reason and the decisions, especially the ZBA is able to um, articulate it, it will, uh, you know, it will help build trust in the integrity of the decision making process. So that is in this situation more important than in the previous uh, question. Also, the, the way it was answered with the legal requirements and legal requirements are important because uh, they uh, uh, for the special permits because these criteria typically are consistent with the town's comprehensive plan so that is also has to be considered when uh, this uh, one party ha is um, obviously uh, asking for special permits so th these um, in the end uh, i guess transparency and accountability i will uh, focus on more because uh, then we do not have any break in the trust in, uh, between the town and the residents. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to uh, Hilda Greenbaum. I would say that the Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial court. We are there to sit and listen to two sides of a case and decide which one has merit. And that not only does we do we have to decide which one has merit, but we have to do findings why it has merit. And those findings have to be such that if we are, if that decision that we make is appealed to a court, that we can legally defend it. So that's my answer. You have to listen to both sides and be able to support with the findings of 10.38 what what is going to happen in a given situation and, and, and make sure it's appealable. Thank you, Hilda. David Allfeld? So I, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to turn this question around just a little bit, just to say that it's, the ZBA represents the interests of the town, the way I'm seeing it. We're, we're charged, as I understand it, the ZBA is charged, I'm going to read this, it operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the Laws of the Commonwealth, for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. 
So that's the interest we're looking out for. And yes, there are, in, in at least some cases, there are two parties. I mean, I guess some cases are easy, right? There, somebody wants to do something, it seems reasonable that <laughs> you approve it. But uh, in, in many cases, there are two parties and, 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 that, and we have to judge, as Ms. Greenbaum has said, we have to judge uh, between the two. But it's the interests of the town that we're looking out for. Thank you, David. Um, and now I'm going to uh, move to John Barner. Well, again, I think uh, the devil's in the details and hypothetical hypothetical uh, matchups between interest parties are are kind of difficult to address. Um, you know, there are some considerations around safety and um, you know public health and uh, preserving our natural resources, and they should be. Uh, uh, paramount in considerations, but after you get past that, uh, health and safety considerations, uh, and you get off into uh, other areas about, um, well, other areas, you know, I think it makes it really difficult to uh, state which party should have the upper hand in a in a given situation. You have to uh, you have to take it case by case. Thank you, John. Um, David Slaviter. Well, I think that, that David Allfeld brought up a point that I agree with strongly, and I think he expressed it well. The interested party that is at the table at all of our meetings are the people of the town of Amherst. And they, that, they are who we represent and who we are there to protect. I haven't seen an, a, an application where there was more than one person uh, applying there there has been public opposition but anybody who appears before the zba should be treated like anybody else whether you're an individual homeowner or a developer or anybody we deal with facts and rules and uh, i think that the our primary responsibility is to the people of the town and the well-being of the people of the town, that's who appoints us to the board. So uh, I don't think that there is a conflict. We need to just interpret the facts. And if there is a compelling case, then we award it. And if there is not, we don't. Thank you, David. Vince O'Connor? Yeah, I uh, go back to um, what David Offeld initiated. Um, which is the you know the reading of Article One. That's that's our purpose. Um, we're and it doesn't make any difference whether the a proposal comes that would serve the interest of this group or that group, or this organization or that organization. Whether the whether they're um, located in Amherst or located outside of Amherst. Um, the long it is the long-term interest of the inhabitants of the town that we should be concerned about. And in, in all of the cases, um, you know, there's really, so there really is a third party in, er, everywhere. There's the applicant, there are um, perhaps the butters and other interested parties, and then there are the people who uh, are not abutters, but but have a but have a larger interest in what the community looks like, feels like, how it can serve all the people. Especially, uh, I think uh, the folks who may, may be forgotten at times, people who live here 12 months a year. This is this is not just a the purpose is not just to serve certain groups, but the entire community. And if we lose track of that, then I think we end up making bad decisions. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Mr. Meadows? Uh, well, a simple answer is no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think both of the Davids... 
enunciated what the what the situation is very well, and uh, except for the fact that sometimes we have to interpret what the best interests of the town are, which occasionally is difficult. But that's what the committee is must do in every occasion, and on the merits of individual petitions. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to pass this on to Jennifer or back to Jennifer. Thank you, Pat. Okay, so we were more than halfway through. <laughs> this is uh, the sixth question. And um, I'll read it twice because it's a little uh, cumbersome. Uh, what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, dimensional special permits in the zoning law and when should they and when should they not be used? So again, your opinion of waivers, exceptions, and dimensional special permits in the zoning bylaw and when um, they should and should not be used. And I will start with Hilda Greenbaum. I, I want to say that since COVID, or maybe even before that, the zoning board really hasn't had any really contentious cases to deal with. We had quite a few of them years ago, especially with house conversions from owner occupied. And I have been to court. So one of the things I, you know, we, we don't appear, but the judge appears and you have to be prepared to defend what you do. And I tend to be a stickler. I, I like to apply the law where I can and waivers, are the only ones that I've dealt with go with chapter 40B they ask for waivers from certain parts of the bylaw because they can. That's the reason for 40B is to make it easy to get the affordable housing through and can ask, they are entitled to, by law to ask for waivers for various provisions. And I think they ran up close to 90 for the 40 ball line, but I'm not remembering exactly. Um, what the other ones were, variances are also supposed to be very hard to get. Your house or property really has to be between a rock and a hard place, which was why I thought I'd be the only one that thought that the, the proposal for the Atkins Corner was something that really was not between a rock and a hard place because it could be developed the way it was, but they didn't, the owners of the property didn't want to develop it that way. And, and so zoning board decided also that that was not worthy of, of being granted a variance. Chapter 40B makes variances very hard and they have to be substantiated. And then if anybody wants to butt it, in order, you really have to be able to prove in court, either the abutter or the applicant, that they have a hardship and the, and the, and the law defines what a hardship is. And um, what, what was I supposed to say? I don't remember what the question was anymore. So I probably said enough. <laughs> I can repeat it, but okay. Um, thank you, Hilda. Uh, Mr. Offeld? Yes. Um, so I will um, have, to, have to plead that I'm a, a bit of a novice here. Uh, so I'm not actually sure on all this terminology. I know, of course, that the <clears throat> that the ZBA handles special permits, variances, appeals of actions of the building commissioner and comprehensive permits. That's what we do. Um, so what is a waiver? What is an exception? What are dimensional special permits? I'm not sure. I've spent a little time this afternoon reading the bylaws and trying to bone up on this. And I find that for example, in the parking regulations, uh, certain regulations can be waived for compelling reasons of safety, aesthetics, or site design. So that sounds to me like it falls under the same category of <clears throat> the request is made, you make a judgment as to whether it's a reasonable request and meets, <clears throat> meets some of these compelling reasons for a waiver. On, on the dimensional special permits, now I think you know, and again, I'm not sure I'm completely up to speed on the terminology here, but it is true that for the uh, uh, 
project that that I mentioned before, Amity Drive and uh, Amity, yeah, Amity Street and uh, University Drive. Um, there was a height um, restriction that was lifted. That was part of the special permit that was provided. So, and there were compelling reasons for for that, and the and the proposer um, made that clear. And again, they had to do with construction difficulty and so on. And, and financial feasibility of the project. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I probably said more than I should given my <laughs> uh, novice uh, uh, position here. Yeah, no, as an engineer, I it was clear you, you understand. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, and the next, uh, I will move on to um, Mr. Varner. Uh, again, this is, Sort of in the realm of hypotheticals, and that makes it a little difficult to address um, uh, anything specifically. Uh, and I realize also that uh, with the rise in uh, ADUs or uh, accessory dwelling units and uh, other mechanisms for trying to increase housing in Amherst, that the uh, whole issue of setbacks and uh, 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 exemptions to uh, spatial permitting uh, are going to be a really hot issue going forward in town. Uh, but uh, the bylaws, uh, Article 4 and several sections of Article 5, deal with dimensional requirements and prescribed uses. And Article 6 is entitled Dimensional Regulations and spans uh, 10 pages of the zoning bylaws. Um, it's, it's noted that the, the zoning the ZBA can't itself write zoning bylaws, but only grant or deny exemptions. And uh, in any uh, proposed exemption, I think it's necessary to study the particulars uh, carefully weigh and uh, uh, analyze them and uh, exemptions or special permits uh, against uh, existing regulations are judged um, based again on uh, issues of public safety and uh, uh, resource conservation uh, as being preeminent in importance. And then after that, uh, you get into considerations where uh, uh, the interests of developers, landlords, and uh, uh, abutters um, should be evaluated on, on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, uh, they should reference the bylaw sections that we've already cited, 10.38, um, as a guide for granting or denying exemptions. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Sloveder. Well, I think these are all useful and are all reasonable for an applicant to apply, uh, to request in an application that, that it would apply to their case. I think they should be judged on whether there is compelling evidence that they should be granted. I can't give you examples. I've, we, I've been exposed to all of these in my two years on the board, but I can't give you specific examples of when I would vote to or not to approve them. But as long as a a compelling argument is presented that is not in conflict with the well-being of the interests of the people of the town of Amherst, then it's reasonable to grant these. And if the argument is not sound, then they shouldn't be granted. But they're all credible tools in determining uh, zoning decisions. Okay. Thank you. Um, Vince O'Connor? It will be next. Right. Yeah. It's asking um, us to have a general opinion about specific uh, waiver issues, uh, um, so forth. Yeah, a little difficult. That that given that what we do is we focus on the specific application in front of us. Um, so uh, I. I would say with regard to each of these, if there are conflicting factual presentations, then I think we have to do our best to decide which factual, because at some points there, there are um, factual presentations and the applicant and those who don't agree with the applicant uh, present us with a choice. Um, and we have to, that's where we have to make the choice of which factual presentation, which set of facts is best uh, 
is in the best interest of the town and is really the one that should prevail in this circumstance and be prepared, Hilda said, to defend it in court. Um, and the other c concern I have is that um, in a lot of situations, we have uh, a section of the bylaw that has many specifics and then um, invites us to uh, to waive the specifics and so forth. And that, that does create a problem uh, for for interpretation, but also just for um, trying to resolve things. Um, and I wish there were fewer of those in the bylaw. They're, that's not our job. They they give us the bylaw, and then we're we have to deal with it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we'll... oh, I'm sorry. I was I was. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. We will move next to Mr. Meadows. Well, again, I, I, as has been said, there's no way to generalize on this question. It's every situation has to be taken on its own merits, and that there is no precedence that's guiding us. So we deal with the issue with the individual request and not the general request. Thank you. Um, and um, Rizwana Khan? Yeah. Okay, actually, to be honest, this is the most important question uh, that I will answer. And this is, I, I really feel that this is the most important and, uh, question in ZBA because, um, because of the fact, um, you know, a lot of uh, housing schemes I've seen being made on those bases and so on. Uh, and uh, and I will have to go with uh, Hilda because she and I really salute her for keeping the character of this place the way it is by not wavering from the you know objectives and the goals of the municipality's comprehensive plan because that is uh, made by the planning board and she stuck with that. That's very good that they didn't do that. But we do, I do acknowledge the fact there has to be flexibility in zoning regulations. Uh, you know, there have to be, has to be considerations for accommodating unique circumstances that is given and as everybody is also acknowledged that. And then also promoting development is also good uh, because there's economic growth and, you know, then you want to revitalize the certain areas or gentrify them. And then there's uh, something called adaptability also. So those three issues are there, but but overall, we should just uh, be very uh, consistent with the plan that has been given to us about how we see this um, town um, to be like. And uh, also the problem comes when um, it's inappropriately used by, you know, for example, um, should not be those waivers should not be granted to uh, alleviate self-created hardships. You know, like for example, property owners will get their own sob story. So we have and financial considerations might be. You know, there are so many cases. There is high buildings. They come in and they bring their own stories, but that is not hardship. So we have to know that. And we also have to override public concerns. That is the instance of inappropriate use. We should not um, uh, have a, a conflict with a comprehensive plan. So that's where the strength comes in of us being in the committee. And then there is also precedent of setting that they uh, there should be, we should avoid setting unfavorable precedents. If we give permission or waiver to one person, so, you know, one stakeholder, the others will follow on. So uh, I, but in this case that we are handling right now, as Hilda said, because she's been here for so long, um, these things uh, they did not do. So that's very good. So this question was uh, quite apt for me personally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, my mute button keeps going off. Uh, and 
For the uh, final response to this question, uh, we'll move to Mr. Offeld. I think he already. Uh, this is number he six. Already, I, already, I already responded. He already he already spoke. I think oh, you. Started, so. I'm I'm sorry. I have you written twice on my page? <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't you don't have to answer again. Um, and I will pass the baton back to you, Pam. Thank you. So we are now at question seven, and we'll start the cycle with David Alfeld. The question is: What is your approach? to incorporating public input into your decision-making. Right, so I, I mentioned the story about uh, the Board of Health and the smoking regulations, and that's, I think, a good example of um, developing some regulations uh, with some sort of options as, as the regulations are growing, um, and then listening to the public, listening, as I mentioned, the stakeholders, the restaurant owners, the uh, other citizens of the town about what's reasonable for enforcement, what's reasonable for um, public health protection. And you just have to listen to the public uh, to, to get that information. So public input is very important. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the ZBA, I, I thought of an example. I mean, it is it is hard to answer this in, a, in a, you know, hypotheticals because every case is different, but Again, one of the um, uh, required findings, 10.383, and I think Mr. Varner referred to this one previously, the proposal would not be a substantial inconvenience or hazard to abutters, vehicles, or pedestrians. So what is a substantial inconvenience? And I may have a sense of that from a site visit. Uh, other board members have, might have a sense of that, but people that live there might have also have a sense of that, and that would help inform how substantial might the inconvenience be and what what's what tips the scales. So I think public input is is essential to uh, these decisions. Thank you. We'll go to uh, John Varner, please. Uh, well, I think that uh, after reviewing the 130 pages or so of zoning bylaws that the planning board has put an incredible amount of uh, effort into foreseeing exigencies and, and codifying responses to them. Uh, zoning regulations are designed to protect the rights and investments of individuals and businesses in town and thereby allow for a degree of long-term stability in town development. Uh, that said, real life demands adaptability. And I think that uh, uh, times uh, adaptability necessitates exemptions to the rules uh, and those are granted by the ZBA. Uh, the general public should be informed uh, well in advance and afforded the opportunity to comment on pr proposed uh, zoning exemptions. Uh, I also think that abutters comments and opinions should be given special weight uh, since they stand to bear the brunt financial or otherwise of any proposed changes to uh, zoning regulations, but uh, they should not have sole uh, say on a zoning issue and uh, it shouldn't, uh, their opinions shouldn't constitute the final say of the zoning board of uh, appeals. Thank you. Uh, David Sloboder, please. I think we should listen to everybody. And I think the public is obviously a very interested party in all of this. And that we should consider all viewpoints and then act on what makes the most sense. So I incorporate, when I'm sitting on a panel, I listen to everything that the people who sign on uh, to speak to us have to say and uh, consider what what they say as much as what anyone else says. So the public comment must be considered. We should be open to everything. Thank you. Uh, we're turning to Vince O'Connor. Um, yeah, on this, I think there's um, a pretty clear um, approach, at least my approach, is that, um, for example, if um, the applicant brings in a stormwater um, uh, uh, description of and why they're doing this, and for example, you um, and 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 the butters 
have employed an expert using um, not just the standard data, but more up-to-date information, um, and come and said, look, the, the, this stormwater calculation is just, it is, um, it's out of date. And this is what will really happen, and this is why we ask you to um, impose these protections for abutting properties. So my, my approach is to encourage abutters, not, because opinions are not facts. They're, some, of them, some opinions are based on facts, but um, I, um, um, I, I remember a zoning, a zoning decision of, of the town meeting that, that relied on factual testimony of abutters that both photographs and, and maps developed by, from photographs and personal observations that really determined zoning of a particular parcel. Well, that, that's really our, our job is on these, is to the public input, is to encourage public input that is um, factually founded. That if, you, if you've seen all sorts of, if, you know, bring us wildlife observations. Um, bring us um, traffic and crash data. Um, encourage people to try to, as much as possible, present factual information so that we don't, we're not choosing between the good guys and the bad guys, you know, whoever you define the, those parties as in a situation, but we're reviewing factual data and deciding which that of factual information is more persuasive, uh, more consistent with the reality of the situation that we're having to decide on. Thank you. We'll go to Craig Meadows, please. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's very important to have input from any citizen in all the, of this town that wants to make their opinion known. And there are, there are certainly occasions, we had an occasion a couple of years ago where we had an abutter that um, adamantly was opposed to a petitioner. And what we, as the ZBA asked them to do, they had not been talking, we asked them to talk with each other and come to an accommodation. And they came back a few weeks later and had come to a uh, to a mutual understanding. And it, it was a very dramatic and a fulfilling way for the ZBA to arrange to meet both the criteria of the bylaw and also the spirit of um, communication and accommodation that worked out well for everybody. So there, while we have to maintain that the bylaws are critical and are our guiding principles, we often can make suggestions both to the petitioners and the, um, and the public for a further accommodation that's, um, that is a little bit beyond what the bylaws say. So it's necessary to hear everyone's opinions. Thank you. We'll go to Rizwana Khan, please. Yeah. I think, yeah, early engagement in the process is very important, especially when uh, we are dealing with key milestones like um, the proposals and reviewing stages. And then also uh, there has to be a continuous updating also uh, you know, uh, in this way, you are continuously evaluating and improving the public engagement process. So uh, based on feedback, uh, feedback is important. And then the other important thing is that we have to learn from that. Those lessons that you learn from the engagement effort are important also. So that helps in the future decision because this is a legacy that we are creating. And uh, 
the residents uh, also, you know, they, they rely on that. That's the trust that they have with the uh, committees and uh, with the town. So that whole loop has to be um, taken account for. So that's how we build accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, please. Hilda Greenbaum would say that we don't have a choice to include the public. Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A requires a public hearing. Public hearing means that a panel has to hear what they have to say. And I would like to say that it would be really nice if the public could be sure that the board was really listening. Sometimes we wonder if the board hears us. So that's my answer to the question. And uh, we haven't had very many really contentious hearings since COVID. I think that inhibits the public in participating in some ways is we, I know right now who's sitting here on the panel and who is listening on Zoom. But if I were on this panel or listening to this meeting and I wasn't on the panel, I would not know who's out there in the audience listening to what I have to say. And that's, that's troublesome because that's not hearing. That, that, that to me is a little bit inhibiting the democratic process if I don't know who's out there listening to what I have to say. So as a, I'll, I'll just say finally that COVID has inhibited the population from coming to our meetings when we used to, before COVID, staff the room when there was something going on in the neighborhood, people were there. And it was a very public performance in that it would get picked up by the newspaper and, and generally published. And that's one reason that I started covering zoning meetings after COVID because the public had no idea what was going on with the zoning board. And I think one of the big reforms you should make in the study of the zoning board are the people who are sitting in the audience know who's there. And I, I'm, you know, who else is there that they can't see? Am I making that clear? Yep. And there are several yep. people there in the audience right now who are studying the charter, and I hope they hear me that the Zoom should be open to people to know who are in the audience to know who else is there. Thank you. That wraps up question seven. And I'm going to pass it on to Mandy Johanneke. We have three, three, three left. Thank you. Um, I think this is the last sort of longish one, um, but we'll see. Um, this question is, what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the ZBA? And we will start with John Varner. Uh, well, I'm really committed to helping Amherst navigate the issues that uh, it faces with regard to housing and development. And uh, I think I've demonstrated this in the past by reaching out a few years ago to uh, people in charge of zoning in other college towns to get advice on how they were dealing with the problem of student rental conversions. And then I passed that information on to town council. Um, I'd really appreciate uh, becoming part of the Zoning Board of Appeals in order to have a more direct input on the direction of the town going forward uh, and uh, to continue my work in uh, trying to, I, you know, I, I had a, a discussion with somebody the other day and, and they were saying, oh, you, you must really not like me because we have different views. And I said, no, I, I, I think we're on the same team. We just have different ideas about how to move Amherst forward. And I think that uh, moving it forward involves a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth. And in the end, we reached an agreement about uh, what to do and how to, uh, how to advance the town's interest. And I think that's really important. And Thank you. Well. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I forgot I was the one that's moving people on. Um, <laughs> um, next up is David Sloviter. Well, mostly I bring the experience of two years on the ZBA. I believe in that period of time and on quite a number of panels. I've demonstrated that I am diligent and competent and committed to this process. I've hardly ever missed a site visit. 
I believe that I have earned the confidence of the chair of the committee, and I believe that I have functioned well. So I have a very good understanding of how the committee works, what we're looking for. I participate fully in everything. And what I mostly bring is that I'm already on the committee in a certain, in the capacity as an associate and know how it works. And I'm glad to be able to make this contribution. Thank you. Um, Vincent O'Connor. You know, uh, there, there are two things. I mean, aside from all the general participation and town committees and so forth, I think what the, the, the council committee should know is first that um, as a zoning board member, I was and am, am a very strong supporter of in-person zoning board meetings, partly to answer to improve the possibility of of uh, abutters and um, and applicants uh, reaching uh, you know compromises. Now, you can't do that in on Zoom meetings. It is very difficult to do. It also uh, it improves the sense of community that we should have, and for a zone, uh, for a zoning board that makes these kind of very consequential decisions, not to meet in public, or not to at least have a majority of its members present at a public meeting, um, that hopefully is also uh, held in the town hall and available by Zoom, I think is a mistake, and it is it diminishes. The, um, the sense of community and, and community participation that I think is necessary for this community to be a vital place. The second issue has to do with the um, practice of staff members providing the zoning board, especially in multiple hearing uh, situations where they, there are more than one hearing on an issue, providing zoning board with Prepackaged answers to questions, uh, to section the question the sections of section 10.38. I I'm opposed to that. I think we we should be providing our own answers to those questions, um, and we should not be receiving prepackaged answers um, for us to essentially rubber stamp. And I hope. If I'm appointed to the zoning board, I will do all I can to put an end to that practice. Thank you. Um, Craig Meadows. Yeah, other than the fact that I disagree entirely with Vince, um, I, four years of experience on the board at this point, I think is the primary thing that I can bring. Um, it's very difficult to get an understanding of what and how to read the ZBA laws in the first year. As was pointed out early on, gaining experience, which as a uh, as a member for a year, it, it takes at least that long to get an understanding of it. Um, and for whatever it, it's worth, I've been on for four years, and I think I've got a relatively, relatively decent understanding of the bylaws, and I still have a lot to learn. Thank you. Rizwana Khan? Yeah, I would like, I have a, you know, I'm committed to serving this community, and uh, as a um, Craig said, uh, I really appreciate uh, what everybody is doing over here, and I want to continue this legacy of, of protect, protecting the swampland, marshlands, and so and the forests and the trees and all that. And uh, also, I want to ensure responsible and sustainable development also, because that is very important also, if, especially affordable housing. 
and so that it can enhance the quality of, and equity of all the re residents. And also, um, I again will go with Craig. I do want to learn and improve my, um, you know, self also as to how it works because I really feel that um, because of the the market, the way housing is, it's really difficult. Especially ZB has a lot of challenge. Uh, enforcing because there are lots of outside players who are coming in with uh, big money. So uh, I appreciate what they have done. And I would like to eagerly engage in some kind of a professional, you know, in, in some kind of a uh, encounter with them or some kind of a connection uh, uh, about how to go about in preserving the character of this place. Thank you. Thank you. Hilda Greenbaum. I can bring nine years of experience on the board as a member of a panel, sometimes as chair, sometimes writing decisions. I have a 65 year history of zoning in this town, having lived here and been on both sides of the board as an appellant for various um, historical projects we wanna, wanted to do and uh, as deciding on other people's projects. I know the geography of the town having lived here and I actually came in 1954 as a freshman. So I know the geography of the town being an assessor for six years. I know most of the houses that were built more from 30 years ago than from more recently after COVID. I know the bylaw with all its foibles and believe me, it has lots of foibles. So there's lots of guessing to be done about what does this actually mean and I've gone and done my research online, back through the old town reports from years ago. And yes, I believe there was a huge redaction of the bylaw around 1964, and that's when complementary use came in. Um, I read everything in the packet. If I don't understand something, I get online and I try to figure out what it is. The areas that I don't understand are areas I disagree with. I wanna make sure that I'm correct in disagreeing when I say that you cannot have two principal uses on one parcel, only if they're complementary. And that was the trick, whether two duplexes are complementary uses or whether they're the same use. And that's still to be adjudicated, but I understand that it is being enforced right now. There are no more two uses on one parcel. And um, if I really get stuck and I don't understand, I go find Mark Wabrowski's definitive book on zoning and I look it up and I still find no complimentary use in Mark, Mark Wabrowski's book. And so if you want me, I'd be very happy to serve again. Um, if you don't want me, you've got plenty of other people here who can do just as good a job. Thank you. David Offeld. Well, I'm not so sure, Hilda. Decades of experience is, uh, is <laughs> irreplaceable um, or takes decades to achieve. Um, let's see. I, I mentioned, uh, I think I've mentioned most everything I wanted to. I Just to recap, I have an engineering background, civil engineering, site development, storm water drainage, hazardous waste management, many topics of that sort that might be relevant to particular cases before the board, also construction experience. I've lived in town for about 35 years. Um, so have a pretty good sense, I think, of the character of the town and the needs of the town and what's what perhaps is good for the town. Um, and, uh, and I have the time to commit to something like this. So uh, uh, I offer my, my skills to the town for this purpose. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Councillor Ette. Thank you, Manager. We're coming to the pretty hard questions. Um, and this one is, please confirm that you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. And if you currently serve on any town boards or committees, 
do you see any conflicts with serving on multiple boards and can you manage the time commitment for all? First person would be Mr. Slobider. I confirm that I have the time and I'm not on any other boards. Thank you. The next would be Mr. O'Connor. Uh, yes, I, I, I do. I do not serve on any other boards. Um, and, um, and I, I actually thank, thanks to question four, um, I, I am able to uh, stay as late as possible, which I, I was unable to do the six months I was uh, on the zoning board previously. But now, again, thanks to question four, I'm, uh, I'm relatively free in the evening. Thank you. Mr. Meadows? Uh, by and large, yes, I do have the time, and no, I am not on any other boards. Thank you. Mrs. Khan? Yes, I am actually fully prepared to commit the time, but uh, I am on one another board. And but I can manage my potential conflicts and time commitments associated with this role. Thank you. Mrs. Greenbaum. Well, I have the time and I'm willing to serve. I'm not going anywhere because I won't get on an airplane. Scared to death of not coming home alive. But um, I'd be happy to serve. And if I don't, I will continue to cover this board for the amherstindy.org and you may not like that as well as putting me on the board you decide <laughs> thank you mr alfeld yes i have the time um and i'm not on any other boards or committees at this point thank you and finally mr vana yeah i'm uh, semi-retired uh, self-employed, uh, my schedule is flexible, and I don't have any other commitments on any other town boards. Thank you. I pass this on to Councillor DeAngelis. Thank you. Um, this is a really hard one. <laughs> it's going to take forever. Are you interested in being a full member, an associate member, or either? <laughs> and I'm going to start with Vince. Um. I'll be happy to accept an appointment to whatever thing the members of the committee think is best. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Mr. Meadows, Craig? No, uh, full member. And uh, Ms. Khan? I'm open to either. <laughs> and Hilda? I would like to say associate member. Oh, OK. Thank you. That's important to know. David? Yes, the I've got a steep learning curve. I think associate is appropriate. Okay. Thank you. And John? Uh, I would be happy being either an associate or a full member. And Mr. Slavater? I'd like to be a full member, please. Can I ask for a clarification? Would you accept if you were an associate again? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I meant I... Didn't mean to be ambiguous. No, I'm. I am. You weren't ambiguous. Interested. I just wondered. <laughs> I'm. I'm only interested in being a full member. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll hand it back to the chair, Pam Rooney. Perfect. And I learn something every time I go through this. Um, I actually do see a hand that's been raised in the audience for some time, and because this is a special meeting, not a regular. Uh, meeting of the Community Resources Committee, um, we are not planning to take any public comment. That said, if there's something about the process or the, um, or whatever, um, we have one hand raised and I would like a show of hands or some form of interest from the board if you want to entertain um, hearing from somebody in the audience. So, uh, Councillor Ette. From the board or from the committee? 
uh, you, from, from, from the CRC. Okay, yes. Then in that case, I think without a precedent being set, it would be good to have a question. Jennifer? I agree. And I think I understood that to, to bring people in. Um, Councilor Haneke. Um, I have concerns that we do not have public comment on our agenda. And so taking any comments from non-interviewees during the interview portion um, or, or essentially opening up public comment um, is not appropriate at this time um, because it's not on the agenda and it's something that easily could have been anticipated to be on an agenda 48 hours in advance. Uh, I think I will, I think I will weigh in, um, uh, in the direction of being more careful and I, and we will pass on having public comment tonight. So I do appreciate the people that have raised your hand in the, in the audience. Um, you can always email us or or uh, write to us directly if you have some comments you'd like to share. And I apologize for that. Um, at this point, we have we have worked our way through the, the many questions that we posed to the applicants and totally um, thank you for your time and energy putting into this process. Um, it, is really reassuring to me that we have some really terrific people here in town that are willing to step forward and share your experiences and your backgrounds to make this a great place to live. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Councillor Haneke. I guess at this point, we are going to spend some time discussing and making a decision on a motion that we will then forward to town council and again, I need to clarify when we can get this and our recommendation on the on the council agenda. Um, but at this point, we would we would invite you all to join the audience as we um, deliberate. So I will begin moving people into the attendee section. It will take me a little bit since there's a number of. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Really I don't know how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Drop off one by one. Councillor Ette, you have your hand up. Yes, during uh, this brief period, would it be possible to request for a five minute? Recess? Is it Christmas? Yes. Great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we still have Vince O'Connor on the phone. Yes. I so do. my only options are to put on hold or remove. Um, I do not I, have an There option. was a point at which I couldn't hear you or I couldn't speak. Um, I don't know if that's still available, but when I first called in, um, I could, I could only hear, but I had to unblock. I had to unmute myself by doing star yeah. six. And, um, so, um, so, so I'm, I'm going to start I, with the put on hold, um, Pam. Okay. And 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 Vince, I do not know what that will do. Um, everyone else had a um, place in the attendee section, and and you don't have that option. So I'm going to start with put on hold, and and we'll see what that does. I do not I know what it, it will if do. If it knocks me off, I'll just call back, and then I'll be muted. And then I'll. I can I'll mute you, it. but we're trying that's, to get that's... you out of the panelist side. So so let me try. I have well, why don't I have you just mute, mute me? put on hold why and remove. Just mute me? Um, Pam, what would you like me to try? Try, try, yeah. If Vince, just quick, quickly, is it possible for you to uh, call back if you have to? I yeah, I can call back. I have the I have the number. 
but I think I think if you put me on mute, that accomplishes the exact same thing, even though I'm categorized in the thing because I can't vote and I won't be able to speak. Which of the three options would you like me to choose, Pam? I was going to just say, let's try mute. So that keeps him in the panelist section. Vince, can you speak? No. He may be able to unmute himself. I'm not sure. Um, if, if he does, we may be able to um, put mute again or something, just ask him to. Shall I try put on hold? I don't know what it'll do. Um, I think remove I will, will, will remove him from the meeting completely. Um, I, put, I put on hold. I've never I've never used that capability. Oh, okay. That moved him to a waiting room, so then he can't see anything at all. So that's that's not. Let's see, he just he just disappeared from the waiting room. I think he's going to try and call back. So we'll see what happens when he calls because he was in a waiting room, and I could remove him from the waiting room, but a waiting room is not able to see. The meeting. I think after three years of Zoom, we would all be fluent with this. It appears he has called back and is now in the attendee side. I'm not seeing him. Oh, there it is. Good. Okay. So that's good. Thank you. You're welcome. So for the audience again, we are on we are on a very short break um, between interviews and deliberation. So we'll be back very shortly.
got chocolate. <laughs> not fair, you're not sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Have a bite. <laughs> Oh, boy. Can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. We're, re we're resuming the meeting. It is now 8.35. Um, great round of questions and, and responses. I wanted to review essentially um, two important pieces of information. One, the the vacancies that are open, that's redundant. Um, we have one full three-year position uh, that is an impending vacancy when Craig Meadows' term ends uh, at the end of June. We have one partial full membership uh, when um, the person res res resigned and an appointment to that role would be the remainder of this fiscal year and would would end in uh, July of 2025. So it's essentially a year and a third, something like that. That is a full term, a full member. There are There is one current vacancy of an associate, but next year, starting July 1, there will be the four normal associate slots. We have uh, an opportunity perhaps to start someone early before July 1 to fill the current associate vacancy. And if not, we would start in July. Jennifer. But we are filling we all four, even if three will start in July? I don't understand your question. So will we be, do we have to, I just was, I, I thought we were interviewing for four associates. Yes, so we are. We do not have to do this again before July. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. So one starts now and three start July 1st. To decide that, if, if that works great, that would, if when somebody starts, um, probably is immaterial. Right, but we'll uh, pick four tonight. I mean, or we can pick four tonight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to just quickly review the criteria for a healthy and effective multi-member body that comes from our from our, our notes. And the criteria are, we will consider factors such as a strong base of seasoned members who have completed or nearly completed at least one term as a member. They bring an understanding of process, knowledge, and can mentor new members. To new members who have served, newer members who have served less than one term, these members bring new energy, outlooks, and ideas to the body and ensure the body will continue to have a strong base of seasoned members in the future. And number three, members who reflect the diversity of the town's residents e.g. in age, gender, race, income, home ownership, rental status, location of residence, et cetera, and are broadly representative of the town. The input from the body's chair um, is collegial, willing to listen, not only to the views of the applicants and public, but also be sensitive to the opinions and expertise of other members, geographic distribution, length of residency diversity, economic age, employment, renter, homeowner diversity, background in housing, architecture, construction, lighting, landscape design, or law, an understanding of the quasi-judicial nature of the CDA, applying the bylaw and exercising judgment and discretion, previous service on town boards, being willing and able to attend site visits, study and prepare for hearings, and devote time on weekends for our meeting, weeknights, excuse me, for our meetings. Um, so that's just a refresher in what was being asked for. We all received a message from the current ZBA chair, Steve Judge, asking for some consideration. Um, I open the floor to discussion. I'm looking at Pat. 
<laughs> Damn, I hate going always first. Have good, always have a good perspective of, of uh, sort of the I, 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 It's a very interesting pool of people. Um, and um, I'm, I'm dismayed by the lack of diversity, actually. Um, in terms of geographic uh, relationship to the town. Um, it was a concern before, but it feels more intense this evening. Um, and so I, I really don't know where I am right now. I guess the other thing I'm having a problem with, and I understand Mr. Slavater's position about wanting to be a full member or else, but at the same time, I kind of feel... A little trapped by that. Um, and I really don't know who I'm choosing yet. So it's, you know, I want him and everyone else to know that I'm not, um, I wasn't not going to choose him, but I, I don't like that feeling. Um, I can understand more directly why uh, Craig Meadows, and maybe this is unfair of me, but I understand more directly why Craig Meadows uh, wants to remain a full associate. Um, and he certainly has the experience and should be a full member. Um, I like the, you know, there's, I think, I don't know each of these people's situation, but it seems like there's only one renter in the mix. Um, but I don't know everyone's situation. Um, and there's only one person of color, two women, um, And yet, so these are my little concerns. I also think it's a strong pull of people. Um, so I'm, what there was, yeah. I mean, I feel, <laughs> I feel like everybody kind of said the same thing almost. My other concern is, um, is, in terms of how do we hear a butters and how do we hear the town? Um, and I go back to 132 Northampton Road where the direct of butters were totally opposed to the project, yet the town welcomed the project. Um, and that was a very interesting conflict. And um, luckily we have East Gables, and there are 28 people living there. And I have a feeling, because this has happened in every other Valley CDC uh, project in Northampton and other places, uh, the abutters don't see problems that they truly thought were going to happen. Um, and then there's a, a reconciliation and people are welcomed into the neighborhood. And um, I'm very, I, I'm going to, you gave me permission to talk, be careful. <laughs> I'm very interested in David's experience uh, as an engineer around water and things like that. I really feel strongly he should be one of the associates. Um, you know, I, I, I look at, you know, uh, Hilda's experience and Vince's experience and I go, oh my goodness, you know, um, And, and also, you know, looking at John um, and seeing a sort of sense of a commitment and, and, and uh, a willingness to serve. Um, and with Riz, Rizwana, while she brings diversity, I also, I, and the sense of advocacy and engagement, I'm, I, I got stuck with in the, um, the idea that uh, the character of the town is more important than anything. And th there was a holding to some of the issues that I think are blocking development in our community. So I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. That's fine. It's only a partial response, but you know, other things will come out. We'll, we'll work it through here. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Thank you. Um, I actually want to echo a lot of what Councillor DeAngelis said. Um, 
particularly around geographic location. Um, the continuing members of the board thinking about July 1, um, because many of the appointments we're potentially recommending tonight will be for July 1 of next year for at least a year. Um, even those, uh, except for one possible one that might start immediately and only go for three months. But um, but everything else continues into next year. The three continuing members, two of them live in downtown. One of them lives in South Amherst. Um, five of the seven applicants live in downtown. Um, that and and given our selection criteria, um, both within the council selection criteria and um, the chair's advisory criteria, um, there seems to be a desire um, and cri selection criteria to diversify the geographic location of members. Um, and so that would lead me to weigh more heavily those that don't live in downtown for at least one of the um, full positions. Um, since the full members have, in some sense, you can think of it as a first right of refusal to serve on. They're like the default for serving on every, every hearing application. Um, and so um, I, I don't know what to do with that though, um, because they're just, that that eliminates for one of the positions and whichever one it is, five of the seven. Um, and that's, it, it really actually more brings home the, more about us saying the pool was sufficient without potentially considering what our geographic diversity was before we got here more than and then puts us in a tough spot here um looking at the other selection criteria previous service um on town boards of committees would favor um Vince O'Connor, David Offeld, Hilda Greenbaum, Craig Meadows, David Slavater and Rizwana Khan um Non-broad representation of the town um, has a little bit of favoring beyond the geographic diversity that, that would favor Hilda Greenbaum and Vince O'Connor, um, would favor Rizwana Khan and Hilda Greenbaum, and probably also Vince O'Connor in terms of some of the other criteria for diversity that were mentioned. But um, Background in housing and architecture, given what we heard today in the statements, favors, um, as I start looking at these things, David Offeld and John Varner um, for David Offeld's civil engineering experience and John Varner and construction experience and John Varner's construction experience. So, I, you know, um, then I look at the selection criteria for a good base of season members and newer members. Um, two of our three continuing members have been on the board one year um, and that's it. And and the third one, our ch uh, the chair has been on for five years. And so that to me thinks we need to be looking at at least one of the full positions to be a seasoned member, um, which would favor Craig Meadows and Hilda Greenbaum. Um, and the other open full position, um, could actually slightly weigh towards those that have a little bit experience instead of no experience on the ZBA, um, because we're we're kind of light on some experience um, for full membership. But but I think I'm I'm sort of all of that is to say I don't know what to weigh more on all of this, and so I I really don't know in some sense where I am. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah. You're muted. I'm sorry. You're muted. In terms of ge geographic diversity um, and living downtown, um, I know it might seem like we live downtown, but 
<laughs> there are two members that live downtown. I know you're talking about Craig Meadows and David Sloveter. They live in very different neighborhoods. They I don't they don't live near each other. They don't live downtown. Um, I the um, chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals wrote to all of us and said that he really valued you know, um, Mr. Meadows because he's he would it's kind of customary to serve as we do on the um, planning board and I believe the resident members of the finance committee if they're members in good standing the we usually do you know if they want to serve a second term they serve two consecutive terms. And so that would be Mr. Meadows would be if he were selected as a full time member going for, for the next term, that would be his second term. And the, um, the chair said that he has been relying on Mr. Meadows to fill in as chair when the chair um, can't be at a meeting. And then he also um, said that he would you know like to see Mr. Sloveter, who served two years as an associate move up to a full-time member because that's also the associates. And as Mr. Meadows said, it takes really a year to get the hang of it, at least a year. So the associates on the Zoning Board of Appeals has kind of been a stepping stone to a full-time member. So David Sloverter has been a you know strong member for as an associate for two years. And I think the chair of the ZBA was even saying he's you know kind of paid his dues and it would be appropriate for him to work, move up to a full-time member. And then that leaves four associate spots. And um, Hilda Greenbaum said she would only, I mean, two of the interviewees said they only wanted to be considered for associates. So we, I guess that leaves us with five applicants. If we, if we were gonna give Mr. Meadows the courtesy of a second term and then you know, which makes sense. And as the chair of the ZBA, um, you know, has suggested and I guess in, uh, encouraged us to move Mr. Sloverter, who's been an associate for two years up to a full-time member. And then we have, I guess there's five applicants to consider for four associate members. And I think those five are all strong. So I don't know how we choose that. Okay. And I, I did want to add, I think there are two renters. I think um, Rizwana Khan and Vince O'Connor. Councilor Ette. Again, we're just pondering what are the what are the options? What are the considerations? I think ponder is a good word to use. Um We've spoken about some of the criteria. I've been thinking a bit about the answers, and I I don't know if it is the questions or if it is the experience that everyone brings. It is hard to distinguish the candidates this evening based on the answers that they gave. And so I ponder. I'm I'm happy to also weigh in. Um, the The understanding of the chair, and I think we've we've been through this enough times to recognize that um, the CRC does its job, but we. We've, we've certainly left the chair hanging in terms of um, his ability to distribute people to panels in a, in a timely manner if he's, if he's short staffed. And I, I have watched a number of ZBA meetings. Um, they are run very efficiently. They are very, very fact-based. Um, and I, I think I would also support, um, 
the, the renewal of Craig Meadows for the position that he currently holds as a full member. There's, there's, it would be, it would be silly to think that someone would go from a full member to an associate member. So we just cross that off. Um, it, it doesn't matter to me that David Sloviter was, was specific. I'm, I appreciate when people are, are open. Um, that he was specific in saying that he would be interested in a full-time position. He has served, uh, he served one year as an associate and then was not promoted in that second time, in that second round. I um, actually appreciated the fact that he was still willing to serve. And I think he's done an outstanding job. I would, I would very much support uh, his being promoted to a full member. Then, as Jennifer just mentioned, we have we have five really strong candidates um, with with a really rich and varied background. I love the idea of having somebody with hydrology uh, and civil engineering as as an expertise. It's always very helpful, especially when you're dealing with, you know, the kind of the kind of project that was discussed at Atkins Corner, where you you truly understand uh, what topography and geology and water table means to a project, and you bring somebody like that um, to those kinds of projects. I think that's um, really valuable. Um, I'm thinking about Hilda Greenbaum's experience with 40B. 40B is the quote unquote fast track for um, for getting approvals for our affordable housing developments. And we're going to be looking at, I hope, we're going to be looking at Belchertown Road and the East School coming up. So that experience is is extremely valuable um, for, for having on a panel. Um, the in my mind, the person that brings, as as she actually stated, the least amount of experience in the technical world of zoning and um, and bylaw interpretation, um, in my mind, is is perhaps the the person who could be brought on also as an associate member to learn the ropes with a stated interest in. Um, You know, bring, bringing essentially more outreach is the way I interpreted some of that. Um, and and I greatly appreciate the um, the construction experience. Actually, David Sloviter and John Varner um, both mentioned that, and I'm, I'm I'm forgetting who the third person is. Oh, David Alsfeld, uh, with some construction experience. It's just very very helpful when you're when you're um, interpreting the plans and understanding the impacts in a, in a physical structure on the ground. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm leaning. I'm, I guess I'm less, I'm less concerned. Well, in, ter uh, in terms of geographical diversity, we would have, um, we have two candidates in North Amherst, one candidate in South Amherst, um, and then the rest in between, and I, I am I am frankly less concerned about if if all if all criteria are not equal. I think to me that's really the least um, the least valuable criteria for um, a, a functioning and effective zoning board of appeals. Mandy. Um, we don't have any candidates in South Amherst. John Varner lives in South Amherst. No, he lives on Jeffrey Lane. That's South, which is not South, South Amherst to me. I mean, maybe we just disagree on what South Amherst is. That's above the. That's 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 by the common school to me. That's not South Amherst. Um, 
you know, and oh, and so I guess we're just going to disagree on where on what you sit. Yeah. <laughs> South Amherst is. That's not South Amherst to me. Um, it's closer to me to downtown than it is to the South Amherst Common. <laughs> um, and so it's not South Amherst. Um, okay. um, but um, but beyond that, I'm wondering if. We could potentially, I'm, I'm trying to debate whether I want to make one motion now to see if we're, we're in a spot where we can deal with at least one of these openings. So I, I think I might make a motion um, to recommend that the council, so I'm going to move to recommend that the council appoint Craig Meadows as a full member of the ZBA for a term to begin July 1, 2024 and end June 30, 2027. Second. Any discussion? Um, can, uh, for those that are watching, we have a whole, uh, can I just explain? Sure. You know, you've explained it once, but but we have a whole lot of different terms with different things, um, um, and and this is the, this motion deals with um, makes a rec would make a recommendation for the one full term that is a full three year term because it's not filling a current vacancy. It's the one the one full member term that is expiring at the end of. June this year, um, and it's the only one the council needs to fill as a three-year position for the year. Um, and it is, in fact, um, Mr. Meadows' term that is expiring on June 30th that is creating this, this vacancy come July 1. Jennifer? No, and just maybe explain for people that the other full-time position would be available immediately, but just run for one additional year to fill the space of someone who's resigning. Who already did resign. Yeah. Right. So someone resigned half of the, halfway through their term and it has remained vacant as, as has an associate spot remained vacant. So the, the ZBA um, has, been working on low fuel for about a good half a year. Let's take a vote. Um, to the motion was to recommend to town council that we appoint Craig Meadows as a full member um, for a term starting July 2024 and ending June 30th, 2027. Let's go around the room. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Councilor ha Haneke. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Pam Rooney is also a yes. So that was a unanimous. I think given um, David Sloboder's two years of experience, oh, Mandy, you want to put your name up? I, I mean, sorry, you have your hand up. Do you want to speak? Um. So, yeah, I would like to speak. Um. So, so with that motion sort of recommended, what we're now looking at regarding recommendations is a three month associate term that ends June 30 um, and starts whenever the council can act. And then four associate terms that begin July 1 and end June 30 of 2025. And one full term that would begin immediately and end June 30, 2025, the same time that the associate member terms are uh, would end. Um, which means we would be looking at basically appointments for five people that all end at the same time. And it's a matter of 
whether they're technically a full or an associate. And so I guess I, we had a lot of discussion last year regarding full versus associate. Um, but those were three-year terms versus one-year term. Right now we're looking at basically the same length of service. And so I guess I'm, I don't quite understand um, why someone would take only a full member rather than an associate um, when the term length of term is basically the same. Um, I, I, I understand more, I guess, why someone might take associate and not want to be considered for full, um, given some time const constraints, because associates don't aren't aren't you know it, you might not want a time constraint that every meeting requires that an, a full does. But I guess I'd I'd like to explore that difference a little more as we talk about essentially five positions that are open for the same length of appointment or basically the same length of appointment. Okay. Jennifer. Um, so I think a full-time, I mean, there is a difference between a full-time member and associate member because a full-time member serves you know each time the board meets they're they're on the board they're part of the panel unless for some reason they can't make it and in this case mr you know david sloveter said you know he has been available for all the meetings that he has been called to and would be available <clears throat> to serve as a full time member um and that would so it would start immediately i guess it would be what 15 months um and it just seems He's a mem he's been an excellent you know associate in good standing. The chair of the ZBA has in you know has said he would like to see that candidate who has been an associate and is the only associate currently applying to be a full-time member to have this candidate move to that position. And it seems why would we not do that? I mean, it, it seems disrespectful, frankly, to decide we're not going to do that, especially it's for it's to fill, continue filling out a term that goes for one full year. And what is it, the two or three months between now and July 1st? I don't understand why we wouldn't do that. And it seems, I guess, disrespectful to me, to Mr. Sloverter and to the uh chair of the ZBA. I just don't know why we we wouldn't do that. And I don't think the other applicants, two of whom said they specifically only want to be considered for associates. I mean, I, I think it's understandable that somebody who's been serving as an associate for, for two years and, you know, he's willing to move into that one year position. He was not specifying he wants a full three year term. I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Andy. The full member position that Mr. Sloveter, Sloveter says is the only position he will consider now has been open since November of 2023. And in November of 2023, when he was approached to apply for this full member vacancy, he responded to that approaching from the chair of the CRC, um, saying that he would not go through the quote charade again, that it's cruel to even suggest that he is eligible and should consider doing it. Um, and that he confirmed at that time he would not apply to fill the full member vacancy because it would be a waste of time and effort. And I hate bringing this up because people can change their mind. 
but I have serious concerns when Mr. Slavater in an interview tonight says he prides himself on reasoning in a cooperative manner without anger coming to the service in those situations was pivotal in helping to reach consensus, yet applies to replies to an email with what can only be considered anger. And so I have concerns about his dedication to the ZBA, um, given his complete turnaround for the exact position that we would be considering him for. Um, I trust that Mr. Judge has um, been been accurate in how Mr. Slavider has served as an associate member on the ZBA. Um, but Mr. O'Connor has also been an associate member on the ZBA um, for slightly less time than Mr. Slavider. And Mr. O'Connor brings diversity and frankly, that lack of concern in my mind regarding Mr. Slavider's ability to remain neutral um, that Mr. Slavider doesn't bring. And so I have concerns about um, Mr. Slavider as a full member. Um, yet I don't have those concerns with him about an associate member and continuing the associate member. Although I do have some of them, but I would be willing to um, appoint him or recommend appointing him to an associate member. But given the anger he expressed in response to a chair of a committee following procedure, I have concerns about his ability to remain neutral without anger, despite what he says in his interviews. And it's hard to say this in public, but the email he wrote is a public document. I'm gonna to reply to that. And I think that, um, you're, you're comparing two people, Vince O'Connor and David Sloboder. And Vince did, yes, serve as an associate for about three months. So it's a, it's a very different time frame. Um, and Mr. Sloboder has served for nearly two years. Um, if I were to recall history, there was a very interesting, I'll call it turn of events, where in fact, the the we don't have to hold by normal tradition or normal way to work that somehow if you're an associate you automatically get promoted to a full-time member but if my recollection was that we continued three members who were associates who had a year of experience under their belt and we continued them as associate members rather than giving them the recognition of their hard work and promoting at least two of them to full-time positions, full member positions. And I think I would be, I'd be pretty annoyed. I'd be pretty um, hurt by that kind of treatment, especially having done a good job. Um, I think, I, it feels to me in this case, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just going to say it. It feels that this is sort of an emotional reaction to the situation, rather than basing it on um, the facts that that the chair laid out for us. I, I cannot presume to better understand candidates than someone who has had to work with them for the last year or two. I am, I am going to strongly support that David Sloviter get a full-time position as recognition of the time he has spent um, as an associate. Our second associate member, current associate member has stated that she is 
just feeling okay being an associate member. She's, she plays a very important role and um, will do, you know, probably an equal amount of work. But I think, I think we have to recognize that we, we may have been, uh, we last time ended up recommending people with zero experience as full-time members. And that was completely contrary to what the chair at, at the time had asked. So um, I'm, I'm, that's, that's my position. Jennifer, and then Pat. Um, yeah, I, I also think, you know, it may be particularly for the, uh, you know, who benefit from Councilor Ette, who the four of us were, were on, were here the last time we interviewed for ZBA. But what happened is there were two alternates, two associates that, and David, Mr. Sloverter was one of them. Two associates were applying for the full-time position and you supported the other candidate moving to the full-time term position, even though there were spaces for two and not Mr. Sloverter. So he, I'm not defending the, you know, words perhaps used in the email, but I think it might've felt like you were inviting him to apply again when it was clear that you weren't probably going to support him. So I, I think that's where the response was coming from. So, um, I mean, it's, it's feeling, I, it's, I think it's important that the process remain as objective as it can. And if, you know, a full-time member serving in good stead gets to serve for a second term, if they so choose, and that associate members can move up to full-time members, in this case, uh, Mr. Slover has served two terms as an associate member. He's fully, he's been, you know, a member in excellent standing. He's supported by the chair to move up to a full-time member. It's a year membership. I, it, I can see where it seems like there's something personal going on. I mean, it seems like if we're going to have a process, I, I can't see why Mr. Sloverter would not um, advance to be, to fill out the next, you know, 15 months of an open full year term. It's feeling, it's feeling to me like there's something personal going on. And it feels like there was frankly last year as well, because one of the associates, you know, you were supported to move up, but, but not him. And, um, and that was before there was any email correspondence. Hi, Pam, I have my hand raised, but I wonder if Councillor Ette wants to speak before me. Sure, if he's willing. I'm bewildered. I think a lot of the conversation is flying over my head. I, I, I know, I understand English, I know what the words mean, but I can't draw meaning from them. Um, so, in this case, I'll simply listen while I continue to ponder on some of the other candidates to fill some of the other spots. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if I can speak, Pam? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify that we selected two inexperienced um, full members we appointed two people. Uh, one person had a lot of uh, land and um, zoning and uh, experience without any credentials, and the other person was a lawyer, but they were compromised candidates because the committee was really split. Uh, and from everything we've gotten from the chair, those two inexperienced members have done an incredible job. Uh, I was hoping that after reading statements of interest and listening um, to responses that David Allfeld could be a full member and that's not what he wants and I respect that. Um, I am more interested in Vince O'Connor than I thought I would be because of something that he said that was important to me. Um, on question number six, which I don't know exactly 
My question number six was, what's your opinion of waivers and dimensional exceptions and everything? Everybody gave great answers on that. But one of the things that he said was, that it's always, I'm paraphrasing badly, Vince and everyone, uh, there are always conflicting factual presentation. Uh, those who don't agree uh, have different um, facts and that the role of the ZBA is to really sort out the facts uh, apart from the emotion uh, to be um, thoughtful about that. So I still want David to be a full member, but I understand I can't have that. So I, I feel like I can support Vince because I've experienced him um, as someone who really listens and really is willing to challenge his own assumptions. And that feels important to me. Um, That feels important to me. And I, I understand, I'm, I don't feel like I'm being disrespectful to Mr. Slavater, to David. Um, I don't know him. I am concerned about the geographical connection um, and, um, and other things I've learned about his opinions over the years through public comment and um, you know emails to counsel and stuff. So I'm I'm not ready to support him as a full member. Um, I absolutely support Hilda as an associate member. I support Mr. Varner. He's come back after a, a rough uh, round a couple of years ago, uh, particularly with me. Um, we bumped into each other at the survival center, um, and uh, it was just interesting to meet him. Um, but I appreciate what I appreciate without knowing him well is that he's come back, and he's saying, "I want to, I you know, I'm going to look at this again." Um, and I, you know, I if Mr. Slavater would not accept an associate position, then I feel like I would want to move to Rizmano um, because as I just learned, you know, she is a renter. Um, she is female. She is not white. And I don't say that lightly. Um, and I don't know what her experience is in terms of uh, she could have, have led a very privileged life or, or not. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, but I, I'm interested in what she's potentially bringing. Um, so I think that's where I am. And I'm, I still feel open to moving around in here. Thank you. Oh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I'm still feeling very strongly about David Sloviter. I remember last time there were two associates who interviewed for the full-time position at one of one of them is not someone who I actually usually see. We have very kind of different uh, points of view on, on zoning and development, but I was willing to vote for her to move up to a full-time member because I felt that she deserved it. She had been a associate in good standing and it's not about me and that somebody, you know, is going to vote the way I may vote on, you know, everything that comes before the ZBA. Um, and it's not a popularity contest or it's about personality. So I felt that that person who I don't, again, always doesn't often vote on zoning matters the way I would, but I felt that she deserved and was a member of good standing. The uh, chair of the ZBA had recommended that she moved up from zone from associate to a full-time member and I was fully on board to support her as I was with David Sloviter because he had they had both been associates for the same amount of time in good standing. We're both applying to be 
full-time members, both have the support of the chair. And there was, there, I'm going to say, you know, the same, you guys didn't want to vote. I don't know why did not want to vote for David Sloboder. And I'm feeling the same thing now. It's like, there's, I just don't understand. He's said he would like to, you know, serve out. He, he's not, you know, Craig is been a full-time member and David, it was not, you know, expressing interest in being a full-time member for the next, for a full three-year session, but was willing to serve out the remaining full-time term. And it just, it's feeling like there's just, um, it's very personal determination for Mr. Sloverter not to be able to move up to the full-time position. And I don't understand why. Um, in terms of the associates, it's really hard because I think all the candidates that we interviewed were were terrific. So I totally support as an associate, John Varner, David Offfield, Hilda, Roswana. Um, you know, I, th uh, I think that those would be, you know, and, and Vince, but I think that, you know, you're saying that, and, you know, I, I've supported, uh, I'd love to see John Varner and David Offfield and Hilda and Roswana as associates. And I guess John Varner's, which I agree, I think it's great that he applied again after being, but if he came back, so is David. He's coming back the third time. I guess the first time he applied wasn't for an associate, but he's coming back. He's applying for the third time, two times as an associate, and now to fill out the remaining one year of a full-time position. And I think if we're, that I, you know, again, I think it's great. Mr. Varner came back, but so is David Sloverter. So I would be willing that that's who I, I'm. So I all to say we would have, we have five excellent candidates for associates and I don't know how we're gonna winnow it down to four. Pat. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't want David, Slavater to leave the ZBA. I would like to see him as an associate. I understand that's not what he wants, uh, but I would like to see him there. I, um, that's just true. Um, but I, I, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Councilor Ette, do you want to add anything at this point? Um, just uh, maybe clarification again for my benefit. So how many spots are open? What are the positions within those spots given the number of people that remain? We had seven, I think, this evening. One is gone, so that leaves six. Um, so that would be helpful while I make a decision. Okay. So we, we just voted on the one full three-year term, and that is one that would start July 1 and go for three years. And we supported Craig Meadows for that position. One of the previous uh, um, ZBA members, I really apologize, I don't remember his name, uh, resigned in the middle of a term, and he left a vacant full position. Um, the ZBA chair has had to use uh, his his stable, if you will, of of associates very heavily because of the because of the lack of this full full position. So there is one full position that that will end um, at the end of. June 2025. So it is a year and a bit, a year and a little over, a little less than a half, which is a full member. Uh, and that person is paneled uh, automatically for, for most projects. And then, the, and then they fill in any shortcomings with associate members. Um, then they're in starting in July 1, again, for one year, there are four positions that are called associate members. And again, it is just for one year, one year at a time, one year at a time, one year at a time. Um, it is 
it's a way of bringing people along, giving them exposure, um, and not necessarily, you know, jumping into the water head first for someone who is interested in finding out if they even have an interest in serving, you know, additionally on the zoning board. So those are the positions, four associates, which is a one-year term, and one remainder of a term that was vacated halfway through. Um, Madhuri, if you give me a moment, could I ask a question? Um, sure. So for the full one year, once that is done, what happens afterwards? We need to, can this same person for transition or continuity continue on maybe with a new term? I'm not sure I understand your question. So we have a full three year term and then we have someone who resigned and is um, a gap until that expires in a year. Yes, yeah. so saying what happens after that year ends, this term ends. Let's go through this process again. And we and we seek candidates for a full time to to fill that full time position, and they may come from the associates who have been serving for the for the previous year. Mandy, um, I like Pat and. Um slightly disappointed that David Offeld is not seeking a full um, position um, given his civil engineering experience. But I, I, in addition to Hilda, uh, uh, I'm slightly disappointed she's not either. Um, I think I support Hilda, uh, well, recommending Hilda Greenbaum be appointed as an associate for the July 2024 to June 2025 appointment year. I would support um, recommending David Offelt be appointed as an associate for to start immediately. So for a term to start immediately and end June 30, and then also for a term to begin July 1 for the next full associate year, we do have a current associate opening um because there are only three associates right now so i i would support him as um sort of being recommended for um filling the current associate vacancy that ends june 30 and then also being recommended for an associate position that begins july 1 um jennifer keeps implying that there's some sort of personal animosity. And um, I'm not sure I've met David Slaviter in person. At least I cannot remember having met him in person except over Zoom on these interviews. I'm not sure I've met him beyond that. Um, for five years that I've been on the council and for the years that I served on the Charter Commission, um, I have believed that these appointments, as well as the planning board appointments, are political. Um, not everyone believes that. That has been a dispute, I think Pat can say, back through the very beginning of this council as to whether these are political appointments or not. Um, I am one that believes that there is a political element to these appointments. Um, and... There are positions Mr. Slaviter has taken, not just in the interviews, but in times he's written us that um, give me concern for putting him on the ZBA. It's it's one of the original reasons I had, had concerns about appointing him to the ZBA. Those concerns remain. Um, but that, But in my five years on the council, I have appointed plenty of people that I don't agree with politically. So to say those concerns are of necessarily a personal nature, I just have to push back on that. Um, I have concerns with how he handled 
Um, my reaching out to him as chair as I was required to do under the council's policy. Had I not reached out to him, I would have been um, called out for not following the policy. Um, I have reached out to plenty of people in my time as chair that have not been happy with that reach out, but that have responded in a more civil manner than Mr. Slavater did. And given that the ZBA is a quasi-judicial body, the lack of civil response to that email concerns me as a quasi-judicial body to be appointed to. I have, a, you know, so I agree a lot with Pat. I, I don't know what to do with six candidates for five positions or, you know, I, I've got two in my mind. So I guess that leaves four candidates for three positions, um, uh, all of which would accept um, or would like to be considered for the full and three of which would like to be considered for the remaining associates. I will say I still have concerns with um, Mr. Slavater, Mr. O'Connor, um, and Mr. Varner's, some of their answers to the questions today. Um, will that stop me from voting to recommend any particular one of them over the other ones? I mean, there's there's four openings. We know um, that it's hard to keep an opening on ZBA because a ZBA as a quasi-judicial body needs to be able to, to have full panels. I was at a ZBA meeting this past week that had four members at it. And so they all needed to be unanimous votes. Um, that makes it harder um, than when there's five members attending the panels. And so I recognize how much of a issue not appointing members are. I recognize that um, at the, as, as Councillor DeAngelis indicated, um, the last time Mr. Varner was a, um, applicant. I am glad to see him back because it was good to hear fuller responses to the interview questions from him. It really was. Um, and, and, and get a much better idea of, of his, his thoughts than we were able to have the last time he was in front of this body interviewing um, through paper responses um, in that case um, for a position. So, <sighs> I think I would lean. I, I I actually don't know, other than my serious concerns with Mr. Slavater as a full member. Um I I don't know. But but I, I felt I had to respond to um Jennifer's claims of personal animosity. Um that it's it it is not personal, it is concerns related to appointing people to quasi judicial bodies and the the and and my belief of a political it being partially political but but the temperament needed in quasi judicial bodies that I have not necessarily seen expressed by one of the candidates so I'll take a turn um it it is disappointing that someone reacts in a, in a particular way I think what I need to focus my attention on is how does that person serve on the board? And I have, as I said before, you know, I got a bad habit of listening in on ZBA and planning board meetings. Um, I am, I think the qualities that we want in members of this quasi-judicial body are exemplified by Mr. Sloviter in this professional role. And I think that is, those are the qualifications by which at this point I, I will rely on. Um, I have seen him function as, you know, in, in somewhat similar um, projects 
where it is not a, a pro forma, a pro development and anti development. It is a case by case facts on the ground and a very balanced uh, consideration of two projects that you, you might consider as sort of similar uh, large apartment buildings um, in different locations. And I, and I, of any qualification, I think the ability to be concise, efficient with time, to the point, and articulate, and and as was stated many times by Mr. Sloviter, um, the rules and the facts are what what lay out the process and what and what they base their findings on. I think he meets all of those expectations, and I would strongly support his, out of recognition for the work that he's already done, I would support him being uh, promoted and nominated for the full-time position, even though it's a truncated one. It's, it's some recognition of the work done. I think it would be smart for us to vote on that on that one role, we're doing this, we're, we're dividing as we did the other night. And I think it would be good to clarify the, the remaining um, full member role of about a year and a, and a third and take care of that. And then we will deal with um, the positions available for, or the people available for the associate membership. So I will make a motion to recommend that town council appoint. I think Ette has a question. Councillor Ette has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You had to you cut my monologue off. <laughs> Councillor Ette. Um, I was going to say that wouldn't it, it be easier to have the order votes before this one? And maybe I can explain why. Um, I received the email from the chair recommending or at least offering support for um, the three candidates. I listened to the questions and um, I, I had leanings towards several as the process went on. And then at the end, when the question was asked what each candidate would want, um, Mr. Slobida mentioned that he would go only for the full, which at that time felt to me that was a it for it, it forces it forces the hand of the committee. But on the other hand, I want to give deference to the chair who has worked with him and in a way knows um, what he is um, able to do and what he has done with um, the ZBA already. But since that is the sticking point, wouldn't it be better to focus on the order four first with the votes and then depending on what comes out of that, we could decide who gets this full position for one year. I, 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 could we switch the votes? Why why this first one rather than the other four? I think from my perspective, um, I would not like to see us do a default full membership again. It's what we that's what we ended up doing last time. And it was sort of by default that we ended up um picking two people with no experience for the full membership positions. And it felt um, it felt that we had not honored we had not honored the the 
essentially the input from the, the chair. Um, so I, in this case, it feels like it would be, if people are uncomfortable with this decision, we'll find out. And if we don't vote for someone, then that person is um, eligible for consideration in another, in another capacity. Um, and so I figured that would be the, the way to approach it. Man, uh, Han Mandy Jo Haneke. Um, I hate this title. It's really confusing. Two, two things. Um, one, to respond to Councillor Ette about why start with full. If Mr. Slavater is recommended for a full position to start immediately, that opens up another associate position for the next three months so that we would need to make another recommendation on that so it makes more sense. From that point of view, I actually agree with our chair that it makes sense to start with the full position because we might end up with a different type of We'll need a different conversation, potentially additional conversation, because we might be looking at appointing or making recommendations for two associate positions to start immediately for three months <laughs> instead of one, um, depending on how that full recommendation goes. Um, so that's the one thing I wanted to say. So I, I, I do think we should actually start um, with a determination as to who our other recommendation on the full is. Um, I am I, I want to comment on um, the what appears to be the heavy reliance on the chair of the ZBA's opinion to the exclusion or um, not exclusion exclusion is the wrong word um, to a, to the higher weighing than other opinions. Um, we did not offer ask um, every member of the ZBA to weigh in on who they like. We did not ask our planning department to weigh in on who of the seven they want. Um, the ZBA chair did not listen to the interviews um, before we did that. And and I actually go back to, you know, it, it, it almost seems like we had a question in here about, um, you know, and considering, you know, whose interest should be given greater significance. You know, we asked that about that. And I feel like members of this committee are giving greater significance to one person's, um, one member of the community's opinion um, rather than others. And and I, I'm, we need to take that into consideration, but if we're going to take a chair's view into consideration on a regular basis that was not solicited, um, but that then we're going to weigh it as if it was solicited on who. I think we need to change our process to solicit opinions from all members, continuing members, or even our staff, and then weigh them just as well, maybe. Um, so I I respect our chair, um, but I don't want to give his opinion. I don't want to overvalue his opinion. Um, beyond um, how we value the opinions of ourselves um, and and the interview request answers themselves and and our own thoughts and our own deliberations. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, potentially if in another associate position were to open at least for the next three months, then there would could be five candidates for five associate positions. Um, right, because we have four associate positions now. If I, I mean, the Sloverders yes. would become available, then we would have. Sort of. I mean, if if you think of it that way, we have five associate positions now, one, one three-month term and four one-year terms. I'm not really thinking of it that way. I'm thinking Wait, of. Is that true, though? I thought that there, there's an empty included. associate position now for that ends yeah. June 30 oh, and then there's four keep... associates right but positions okay. that start July 1 and and if Mr. Slavater was recommended for full to start immediately there would be a second associate position or for now months. to June 30th or for whatever. 3 months I I'm not necessarily thinking of it separately it's I I'm thinking of it as uh, we should be recommending 
someone that is not a current associate that would we're recommending for associates starting July 1 to also fill the current right, one of vacancy them. of right. associates. So I wouldn't necessarily think of it as five separate positions, no, such that Miss but... Greenbaum is not eligible to be appointed to the vacant associate position right now because she's already an associate. So, um... Yeah, but I can't, I have to, I just keep thinking when last time Mr. Varner interviewed, we kept three associate positions open rather than give him an opportunity to be an associate. So I think, <laughs> um, I, I, so I'm, I'm a little, just have some concerns about the, the whole process, um, but I would support, yeah, going ahead to a vote on the full-time yeah. position that's left. Thank you. I just want to make a clarification about the uh, two people who were selected for full positions. One of them, it's I believe it's Philip, had a great deal of experience uh, with zoning and land use and all kinds of stuff and had uh, knew I, whether it was South Carolina or North Carolina zoning laws by heart because of the uh, or um, because of the work that he was doing. So uh, it, it wasn't as simple as we just threw a couple of people in without any experience. Uh, and, and that's an important clarification um, out of respect for him and also for the process that compromise was a reasonable compromise. Um, uh, I wish I could come up with a compromise right now. Um, but I agree that we probably need to go ahead and vote for the full-time associate uh, based on uh, Mandy's just statement right now about what it does if we don't. If, uh, go ahead, Jennifer. I'll just... <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Sorry. Um. I think I then will proceed with with that motion and that I am going to make a motion to recommend that town council appoint David Sloviter as a full member starting immediately for a term to serve um, starting immediately through end of June 2025. Um, 30, 2025. June 30, 2025. So I'll second that. Any discussion? Any additional discussion? Council Ete. I'm a greenhorn here. Um, so I will defer to the chair and to the answers that I received this evening. I suppose my responses would be different if I had um, more interactions and um, I was more knowledgeable about some of the events that have been shared this evening. But in the absence of that prior knowledge, I'll go with um, what I heard as answers this evening and what the chair recommended. So I'm going to move to a vote. I'm just going across the screen. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Uh, yes. Sam Rooney is a yes. Pat DeAngelo. Sorry, no. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ette. Yes. Councillor Haneke. No. So we have, we are going with, <clears throat> excuse me, with a split vote, we have, um, we have recommended to town council that David Sloviter be, um, fill the remaining full term for the council. I said that poorly, but that's the gist of it. We're going to move to, we're going to move to the associate members. 
So in consideration, we have Rizwana Khan, we have John Varner, we have Vince O'Connor, we have Hilda Greenbaum, and we have David Alto. I heard some some um, consideration of, uh, so before we start, that we would, uh, we now actually have two associate positions that are free. And as Mandy said earlier, I think the, um, the linking the remainder of this term, the, the vacancy of this term, and then starting afresh in July is, is a smart thing. It brings the the ZBA up to full staff or full membership, um, and it gives someone three more months of experience before their before the real full term associate term starts. Does anybody have an issue with trying to do that? Andy. And no, I don't have an issue. I was going to say, I think looking at the remaining five candidates for four associate positions, um, as I said previously, I, I would support Ms. Greenbaum for a July 1 start. Uh, she's currently an associate, so I can't really <laughs> appoint her to two separate associate positions held simultaneously. <laughs> it's not going to work too well. Um, I would support David Offeld for an associate, both for a term to begin immediately and end June 30, 2024, and for a term, a one-year term that begins July 1, 2024. Um, I think I would support Rizwana Khan for an associate that begins July 1, 2024, um, uh, potentially um, giving her a little bit of time to prepare and maybe watch some, some positions and all um, uh, meetings and, and read a little bit and, and, and talk to people before potentially being put right onto a panel or something um and i i'm not sure who the other one is i support but whoever it would be i would support starting immediately so for that sort of three month term plus one but i'm not sure between mr o'connor and mr varner um where I stand, there's there's pluses and concerns with each of them. So um, I, I, I'd i like to hear from others. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, I would really like to see Mr. Varner have an opportunity um, to serve in this as an associate. Like you said, he, I think he interviewed two years ago and he came back again and um, I, would really, um, you know, like to reinforce that stick to itiveness, and I think he's very um, thoughtful and works very hard. I think he'd be a terrific associate member. Pat or Councilor Ete, any, any thoughts? Um. Rebecca, you Council, go for it. Pardon? Councilor um, Council De Angelis. She's pointing at you. <laughs> you go first for a change. Come on. Um, I have here um, Mrs. Khan, Mrs. Greenbaum, Mr. Alfeld and uh, Mr. Varner. And just as was described, I think um, Mrs. Greenbaum and Mr. Varner could fill spots immediately, or those that are available. And um, Mrs. Khan and Alfeld could begin 
with the coming term. That's what I have. So we're we're at least talking the same people and the distribution of their the distribution of their actual terms we can we can discuss. Um I I just want to correct one thing. Um Hilda Greenbaum cannot fill a current vacancy because she's currently an associate member on the ZBA. Right. That's I think is it, did I say the opposite? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that wasn't my intention. Thank okay. you for the correction. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I'm I'm hearing and would would also wait a minute. I haven't said anything, dear. Oh, well that's right. You had your hand up previously. Go for it. I absolutely uh support Hilda's can you know uh for a new term after her term ends. Um I support David uh, Allfeld as a person to come on now, given his experience and background, um, putting him off for a few months uh, when I think we have lots of things coming up around water and siting and things like that. Um, I don't know any of his positions, uh, but the experience really calls to me. Um, and then... Um, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I'm left with three people. Um, and and I, I think one of those people is John Varner. I don't know him well. I'm not sure I would agree with all his positions, uh, but I do appreciate the uh, that he really answered questions this time um, with more detail. Um, and that leaves me with Vince and Rizwana. Um, I don't know where to go there. Um, right this second, I don't know where to go with that. I think I'm leaning towards Rizwana, but again, there were a couple of answers that Vince had in ways that I've experienced him in the past in town politics. Um, He's been a valuable member of a, a town meeting, and so it's a little hard. But I appreciate uh, so, and they're both renters, so that's a that's tricky. I guess I'm going with uh, David coming on immediately, Hilda coming back, John Barner and Rizwana. And for John Barner, are you thinking? immediately or are you thinking July 1? Oh goodness. I would mm, I forgot about that part. I actually would feel like Vince would be more experienced to come on right now. So I'm going to Oh god. Uh I'm, you'll have to come back to me. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Jennifer. Um so I I agree with uh Pat and Mandy about that David Offfield would be terrific to come on now. And I think we have a second that we need to come on now. And it, so Hilda stays. Um, I would support John Varner to come on now. And uh, like Councillor Ette said, it might give uh, Rizwana Khan, you know, a couple of months to, you know, become more steeped in the zoning bylaws. And she's also currently, um, on human the rights human commission. rights commission so i'm sensing a consensus um on this um vince is a marvelous member of the community he is um he bring he brings all kinds of pieces of information and things that we should be thinking about. He's sort of the conscience of the of the community. Um, in this situation, I think I would end up leaning toward Rizwana again for some of the each factor is is such a funny order. It's 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 uh you know Factor A plays into this person, and factor B plays into somebody else. It's never, it's never a one for one. It's very tough. 
Uh, Councilor Haneke, you have your hand up. I was thinking of making a motion. It's going to be longer and Lafina's not going to like it. How <laughs> 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 long it's going to be? But but let me let me try this. Um, uh, I move to recommend that the council appoint David Offeld and John Varner as associate members to the B ZBA for terms to begin immediately and to end June 30, 2024, and that the council appoint Rizwana Khan, Hilda Greenbaum, David Offeld, and John Varner as associate members to, to the ZBA for terms to begin July 1, 2024, and end June 30, 2025. I have a question are on that, Mandy. It, I'm can, sorry, can I, Pam. Is that all right? Uh, can I just second it and then we can discuss? Okay. Oh, mm, could you wait seconding it? Because <laughs> I really have a question. <laughs> I'm going to pull the, my old lady rank. <laughs> I just want to clarify that uh, the two fill now positions would carry over for another year that they'd be completing. And you said 20, uh, I thought you said 2024. So yeah, it's two separate appointments. So the way oh, I they have the motion to be... was, was those two for immediate terms that end June 30, 2024, and then all four for terms that gotcha. begin July okay. 1, Thank you. 2024 and end yeah, June Yeah, you 30, can second it now, Pam. <laughs> Yes, that's a, a great way. I was I was going to construct it differently, but this works. That's what will drive Athena a little crazy. But she'll yeah, well, I'll I'll go back and second that. Any discussion before we take a vote? Let's take a vote. I'm going across my screen. Jennifer Tab. Yes. Cameron is a yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. It's unanimous. We have our associates in place, uh, including some immediate ones. And well, and to, as, 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 as long as the council will uh, vote on this and approve us. Um, can anybody tell me when, I, I will forward this immediately to um, Athena and Lynn. And I think, uh, I'll try to get the wording right. Uh, by any chance, did you write those down, Mandy Joe, or did so you... you can just tell Athena that all the motions were worded how they would normally be worded on a motion sheet, but with the recommend the council in front of it, she'll know what I mean. She'll she'll know what you mean. <laughs> you might have to give her the the term dates. Um, but but I'll try, I... to, write, I'll try to write it out for her. that. Would be yeah. that'd be nice. No, if if you just look up one of the ones we passed, did you'll see how it's worded. Yes. Um, and yeah. all, or one of my last reports about appointing appointments has the recommended motions in it. So you'll see how they were worded. Um, they should, if, if you contact Athena and Lynn tonight or tomorrow, they can likely be on the April 8th agenda because okay. uh, April 8th gets posted generally on Thursday. Yeah, and it would be good to get it sooner so people are- and Get on. On it. Especially the two, the three immediate ones exactly i had this on my calendar from 6 30 to 8 30 this meeting i don't know what i was thinking i'm so glad dave didn't stay Foolish girl yeah it's, ten, it's after 10 <laughs> I we did it everybody stuck with it that was that was tough and um i think the zba will be in good hands so thank you everybody for tonight we'll see you next oh i move uh, to adjourn Yes. <laughs> we'll talk later if we have to for next time. <laughs> There's... So second, we have to do the, we have to formally adjourn. No, we don't. That's just don't? the council. No. Okay. She, she's just doing that to be ultra careful. And there's no, this is not contentious here. So I'm, I, I will adjourn the meeting. It is now 10.08. And I appreciate everyone in the audience that we did not let speak tonight. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.
something to think about next time you plan it. Yeah, exactly. Take care, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.